um, to the first installment of The Rational Mail. That's what I'm going to call this. I think this is going to be the name of this new show, which is just my main channel. Um, thanks for everybody coming in to uh, watch this. I see we have, uh, what, what are the people do we have? We had 161 people waiting. That was great. Uh, so uh, as my first guest, if I want to call it a guest, I, I, I don't really want to call this an interview because this is really more of just like a talk between two guys. Uh, but I don't think um, I don't think people really get to know you unless they're like watching your videos, unless they're watching like the 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 Tate speak stuff that you've been doing. But anyways, I have Andrew Cobra Tate with me today, who is a champion MMA fighter. Uh, yeah. You have to correct me as to what that is. I can see your belts in the back there, but maybe you want to introduce yourself as far as what, what it is that you do right now. Right, so I've done a bit of it all. Uh, Four-time kickboxing world champion. I've had seven MMA fights as well. I, I stuck with kickboxing as opposed to MMA because it was paying more at the time. But um, yes, and now I've moved into a few other industries. I've got a few other things going on. I'm, I'm thinking of returning to the ring in February. But uh, besides that, I uh, have a webcam company uh, and uh, a few other things going here and there. And I'm, I'm out here hiding in Romania on the edge of the world. Are you in? Are you in? Are you in Bucharest? Is that where you're at right now? Absolutely, I'm in Bucharest, Romania, which is, is a it's a place that no one goes. Mm -hmm. So everyone's a bit like Bucharest. What the hell are you doing in Bucharest? And I'm like, you know, the same well, thing you, I do everywhere else. Oh, well, you're you're all over the you're all over the place though. I mean, you were just in Thailand not too long ago too, right? Yeah, I, I travel a lot. In fact, this year I made a promise to myself. I'm going to try and not travel because last year was so crazy. I was all over the place. I lost everything. My, my clothes were all lost and I just was, my brain was fried. I didn't know what time of the day it was. I was traveling way too much. So this year I'm going to try and stay in Romania for the majority of the year. Oh, great. I, I, I kind of like it here. I like that there's not too many other Americans here. I'm a bit, you know, it's, it's a kind of cool little hideout spot. So I'm going to stay here if, if I can. Excellent. So uh, how I'm going to run this today is just like, just, just us kind of bullshitting and shooting the breeze here. Um, I'm also going to open it up to the, uh, uh, to, and it, well, maybe we'll do that. Maybe we'll make this an AMA, a little bit of an AMA uh, yeah. for uh, the guys that are in the chat right now. Um, and if you haven't done so already, please hit the like button. I have to go through all the rigmarole. Um, and then please subscribe to this channel. This is, like I said, this is going to end up being the debut episode of my new, just privately, the Rolo Tomasi show. I don't, I don't know what I'm going to call it. I think maybe I'm just going to call it the Rational Mail. The Rational um, Mail. Yeah. And I think you, uh, you and I also share something else, too. Uh, you like to rescue dogs, right? Yeah, so Romania has a real big uh, street dog problem. Mm -hmm. So a lot of them around. So I've got a deal with a local vet where if I scoop one up, they'll cut their mobile vet. They'll come and give them all the inoculations, blah, 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 mm -hmm. blah, blah. And I'll feed them until I can find a new home for them. So, so basically got, you foster like, like homeless dogs? Yeah, I've got like seven dogs now. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I sound like a great guy when I do that. And I am a great guy. I'm not, you know, I am a great guy. But then also, like, my girl does all the real work. Like, I just come home and say, here's a dog. And she has to do all the cleaning and bathing. And I don't do none of that. I'm busy. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so and, and, that, and that is the girl that you're with right now, that blonde that's in all of the pictures, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Really? Five so she, she helps you with the dogs? Yeah, she, she, she helps me with everything, man. I mean, I'm busy. I'm busy doing my thing. So... Uh, basically, I bring the dogs to her, but then she ends up falling in love with them, and then they want to mm -hmm. stay. How many do you have right now? How many failed fosters do you have right now? Um, they all they're always kind of okay. I mean, we've got a pit bull who likes to, you know, prove his, his thing. Thanks to you, you know. And some, sometimes fights go down, but uh, you know, I, I, I'm tough love. I'm one, I'm a tough love kind of guy. Like, you know, <laughs> you, you want to make too much noise, you want to start fighting. I'm going to beat the shit out of everybody. I don't know who it was. I'm going to come start hitting all the dogs, and eventually, so when I'm around, they kind of behave because they know better. You know? Yeah, I, I've been uh, reconditioning and fostering greyhounds um, since 2010. So now for about nine years. Wow. Uh, I presently have two. I have as I've had as many as five in my house. Uh, but, uh, that's what I did. I did a lot of it more when I was living in Florida right now. I'm living in Nevada. So, um, there's not as much opportunity for that, but whenever I have an opening for another dog, I'm always getting another greyhound and I'm also helping with the, yeah, it's funny. It's, uh, it's funny you should bring this up because I think on Saturday of this week, I might even do a periscope because I'm doing a, um, 
I'm doing a meet and greet Monday for uh, the the Greyhound agency that's here in Reno, and so uh, might even do something like that. It might be kind of fun to do. Well, I'm, I'm sure. thinking I'm thinking if all my, if, if all my women leave me, I can become uh, like a crazy old dog man. Yeah. You, know, you, have, you, know, you know you have the crazy old cat ladies. Mm. I'll be well, a crazy old dog man with like six pit bulls. Well, they say and that's no they say that's how you improve your game, though. So, like, go take your dog out, and it just proves that you have a kind heart, right? Well, <laughs> I, I, maybe I, I don't know. I mean, maybe uh, maybe that proves. I, so, I just like dogs. I like that they're loyal. I I'm not a cat mm -hmm. person. I, I, I'll be honest. I don't feel a thing for cats. Some couple times I'll come down to, into my garden and a pit bull got hold of a cat and ripped it to shreds, and I'm just like, oh, whatever. Like cats are not my thing. I don't care about cats, but dogs really genuinely love you. So I think there's a I think there's sort of a gender issue between like cats and dogs. Obviously, you know the stereotype is that you know spinsters are going to have cats. Um, however, I will say this. I know a lot of spinsters that have those little dogs, like the little Shih Tzu yeah. kind of dogs, and they dote over them probably just as much, if not worse, than a cat. But I think that most guys really have larger dogs, like medium-sized yeah. dog. Medium medium to large-sized dogs, I think, is that's yeah. the, I think yeah. the guy thing. So um, I got a few things here that we were, we were kind of ran down to, to talk about here. The first one I want to talk about was your return to MMA. Um, how is yeah. that... How is that affecting your life and what it is that you do right now? I mean, I know well, you've got your own place to, to, to train, but like, how yeah. is that affecting things for you? The truth is this. I, like, I, I, I decided I was finished with fighting early. And the reason I decided I was finished is because I had other things in my life I cared about. When I fall, I didn't care about anything else. And when I say I didn't care about anything else, I, I meant it. I didn't care about anything. Mm -hmm. And then I got to a point in my life where I started to care about cars and I started to care about business and started to care about money. I started to want to keep all my, you know, she's hot. I want to keep seven girls around and all the bullshit you distract your mind with. When I was a professional fighter, I didn't give a shit about any of it. And then I started caring about other things. But then I got offered a fight and um, I got nervous when I got offered the fight. I, I wouldn't, I'm not going to use the word scared, but I got a bit nervous at the idea of fighting again. And then I kind of learned, I think maybe I've gotten a bit soft and I'm a little bit afraid. And now because I'm afraid, I feel like I have to do it to prove something. So mm -hmm. That's why I'm going to come back in February and prove so, I'm still a man. Prove well, so, maybe I'll lose. You know, that's that's the thing with fighting. You know, maybe, maybe you lose, but if, if I know I'm afraid of something, I feel like I have to attack it and confront it as opposed to. And when is that fight supposed to? Have, when is that going to go down? End of February here in Romania. It's oh wow! Be, so that's coming up then. Yeah, it's yeah. going to be all over the news. It's going to be all over the news and all over TV and blah blah blah. So right. still, cool, cool, very good. Um, a lot of people don't like you, man. <laughs> Why do you think that? Why do you think it is? I, just, I got this on the list. No, like, a lot of people don't like you. Why? Why is it that people don't like you so much? I, you know, I think that one. And we talked about this before. Is I think, I think that the red pill has to sort of include a lot of different guys from a lot of different aspects of life. Um, a lot of guys think that uh, red pill needs to sort of. Um, direct itself to being like more family oriented. Like right? trad cons love to say, like you know, if it's if it's not uh, if it's not something that is benefiting the family unit, then it's not worth doing. Like if you're having sex, then it should only ever be to form a family, and if not, then it's you know it's a sin or it's whatever. But yeah. I think there's that kind of mentality, and I, I like. I don't have I, I don't have a problem with that up to a point. Um, I think that that there's a you know being a family man can be something that can be red pill. But then you're the opposite of that. At least I think that that's what people perceive. Yeah, they see, I mean, your, yeah. They see your lifestyle and they see your Instagram and they see your videos and they see all this stuff. And you know you keep <laughs> you keep getting booted off of, of so many platforms, but then you just keep coming back and then. Within like two years. months, you're back to where you were again. So why do you, why do you think that is? Hard to kill. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I kind of believe in it all, though. My view of the red pill is a very broad one. I believe in it all. I understand how important it is to have kids. Mm. I am, you know, I want to raise them properly. I understand how important it is to have a, a woman who loves you. And I don't think there's anything wrong with loving a woman and having a relationship like that. But I think my view is very like... I, I like to think that my view of the world is quite ancestral and it's quite bare bones in regards to how things were evolutionarily. I look at the world a thousand years ago and a thousand years ago, if you were an alpha male, you had as many women as you want, as many kids as you liked. You were the boss. No one told you what to fucking do. And you were the head of the household. And that's how shit went down. And I kind of see myself on the same kind of level. Like I just haven't changed along the lines where society's changed. I'm still living on the evolutionary platform 
Like, because every man from an evolutionary standpoint at 30 years of age wants to fuck every hot girl he sees. Like, what well, this is normal. And instead of sitting around and pretending, I'm not going to pretend that I'm going to meet a woman so amazing that I don't that I'm, I'm never going to be tempted by another girl. That, that's not that's not true. I'm not going to lie. And uh, that's how I live my life. Now, I will have kids. I will have a family. I, da, da, da. But will I ever be a family man? I doubt it. It sounds like it sounds like you're leaning towards like old school patriarch. You want to you want to be like the guy that has multiple women, that has multiple wives, that has multiple multiple children. I mean, that's well, that's kind of like the old school. That's old school polygamy is what that is. Yeah, it's it's super old school. But I I, I genuinely believe it's the natural order of men. I I believe it's the natural order of human beings and our societies. I believe society is constructed in a certain way because it's beneficial to the to the state. I understand why they make polygamy illegal i understand why they say one man one woman you have kids you know the man is incentivized not to divorce to make sure those kids are paid for unless the state has to do it and even if he has a sexless marriage and kids who don't respect him he's going to sit there anyway and go to work a job he hates to make sure that they can eat food to go to school i understand how the government says things are mm. because they don't want a whole bunch of men like me around like run around and impregnate a bunch of chicks and then they get fresh to me on the phone i just block them i don't give a fuck they don't want, I'm no good for the societal system. So I understand that. But then also I understand the natural order of, of humans is that every man in history, every alpha in history had more than one woman and he had kids from more than one woman. And he was the head of it all. And no one said shit to him because they got, because he was the king and that was how it was. And I don't think that is such a terrible idea. But then everyone's a product of, of their upbringing. My dad was, my dad was the same. He had me, my brother, and, and my sister with my mom. But he was all over the place with chicks all over the place, man. He, he did, he, you know, and he never even hit it. That's just who he was. And and at one, I remember when I was very young, my sister said, because my mom was crying and whatever, my sister goes, you're disgusting. And I remember my dad said to me, my brother, he said, when you're older, you'll understand. <laughs> well, here I am. Dude, is, it, <laughs> would you, is your brother like that too? Does your brother share the same kind of ideology yeah. and the same, exactly. you know, same life direction as you? Yeah, we're, we're pretty much exactly the same. I, mean, I don't have any children yet. I, 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 every girl I get with, every one of them tries to get a baby out of me. Mm. So, <laughs> I, I've got the option. Or trying to, lock, trying to lock you down. But that's, I mean, but you're also in Romania, so things are a little bit different there when it comes to, like, you know, gender parity as far as the, the legal system is concerned, well, right? that's one of the benefits of being here is that there is none of that forced alimony, none of that forced, none of that shit exists here. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, I, I said this all the time about Eastern Europe. If you go to Poland or Russia or somewhere, you see a woman with three kids, she's still in fantastic shape. Yeah. And the reason for that is because if, if the man doesn't want to fuck her anymore, she's in trouble. Mm -hmm. Because then what? Because who's going to be paying for her life? Mm -hmm. So they, you know, so they, they, they value their beauty a lot more. So here, it, it can be a more results-based system. Like if, if, if I, next year or whatever, I would get a girl pregnant, if she behaved herself, she'd be looked after. If she got, she pretended she was an idiot, then whatever. I mean, I, the kid doesn't need much money. He needs food. That's 20 bucks a week. If you want Gucci purses and a Range Rover, you better shut the fuck up. Otherwise, I ain't got nothing to talk to you about. So I'm never going to be the guy who's like, oh, the baby mama makes me, the baby mama won't let me. It's just not going to happen to me. It's just this is never going to happen. So I'm not concerned about it. When it happens, it happens and whatever. So you're you're 30 years old now? Is that what it what I'm actually mean? older. I'm an old man now. Oh, 30, you're older than that. 32. 32. There you go. 32, wow, bro. Okay. You know, yeah, that's no. why you got to get that fighting in now, huh? <laughs> well, you know what? That's a big part of it because you start to think these are my last possible years. I can do it. If I'm going to do it, I have to do it now or never. So you start to kind of – it starts to kind of cross your mind in, on some degree. So, you know, I'm, I'm going to come back. When I was 24, 25, I was the fucking man. Mm -hmm. You, uh, you you kind of succeeded pretty early in life though, right? I mean you were – when what? how old were you when you when you were a millionaire? 27. 27? 27? Yeah, see that's that's yeah. early. Yeah. yeah, that's good. Perfect. And and you want to you, you want to talk about what you do? Yeah, so um, I own a webcam company. Mm -hmm. So I have girls who work on 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 webcams, and they they sit and they talk to guys, and they get paid to do so. And that's what's so interesting. Like my whole view on the whole dating scene is not just it's 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 skewed because it's me as a a rich athlete, and then it's also me as a guy who believes he should have lots of women. And there's also a guy with lots of women who work for him. And there's also seeing the complete other side, all the dudes who have no girls chasing my girls. So I've, I've seen kind of like the full circle of the whole kind of thing. Mm -hmm. and, and, and when I come to my conclusions, I like to feel like they're educated and experienced in regards to the fact that I've, I've, I've seen it all from every angle. 
Mm-hmm. And I know I know what I can get away with, and I know what I can do. And I, I know the realities of women. I know that I could have children with four women, and I know that none of them are going nowhere. I know I could do that if I decided to. I know and I you move, And you moved your business to Romania just to, like, to avoid like me too, or avoid the kind of Western feminist legislation against. Bro, I'll, your come, kind of I'll, I'll come out and say it, man. I got, I, I got hit with a me too case. Oh really? So I I've lived this hell. Mm-hmm. So I, it wasn't actually a me too case. It wasn't a rape case. It was a false, um, a girl lied and said I hit her when I didn't. Mm-hmm. And it, it, she was in my apartment and uh, long story short, she was in my apartment. I just started the can business. She drunk too much wine. She, Western women, man, just mm-hmm. crazy. Drunk too much wine, threw up everywhere, like an idiot. I said, clean up. We had a cleaner. She goes, no, the cleaner's coming tomorrow. I said, the cleaner's not cleaning up. You're sick. You're not leaving this sick all night. Clean the fucking house. What's wrong with you? Wouldn't listen to me. Got all her shit threw out the window. <laughs> I was just like, you're getting the fuck out of here. So I said, get out. She stormed out. Anyway, she, um, she, I owed her some wages, some money, which I refused to pay her, 500 bucks or something. I refused to pay her. And then three months later, out of nowhere, I was, I was in bed with another girl, 5 a.m., and I hear a knock on the door, 5 a.m., and for some reason, I just knew it was the police. Like, instinctually, I've heard that knock on cops or some shit. I just knew. I was like, fuck. I said to the girl, I said, I think you're going to have to go. She goes, is that your girlfriend? I said, I wish it was my girlfriend. It's something else. And um, when I opened the door, they'd sent the crazy man squad. They had full riot gear, tasers, everything, because they must have Googled me up. <laughs> so I opened the door to, like, fucking Robocops, mm-hmm. you know? And, and I was like, what the fuck is this for? And they're like, you're for assault. You assaulted this person. I didn't assault, no, I said, I didn't assault anyone. He said the right thing to calm me down. So I was, I, obviously I was, I wasn't, I'm not saying I was going to resist and whatever, but I was like, what the fuck's happening? He goes, bro, I don't know about your case. They just sent me to bring you in. I'm like a, I'm like a collection delivery service. I got to bring you in. I don't know anything about your case. If you're innocent, I'm sure you'll walk. That's what he said. So I went with him. Long story short, four years. It took me four years to beat that. In fact, it took me, it took me four years to beat that case. That's how long ago this was four years. Even though I had the time she got kicked out the house, I had proof. I had other girls who went in on my side. I had nine witnesses say she was lying. She, I had text messages from her saying she's going to ruin my life. And then, Oh, I had all the evidence in the world, and she had nothing but her word of mouth. And it took four years for me to be that case. Four years of legal fees, four years of being on bail. And then when I when they arrested me the first time, they left me in a cell for two days and raided my house and took every phone and every laptop, went through my entire life and found 10 new charges to charge me with. So it's not even just it's not even just the first thing that I got cleared of. Then it's making a video while driving on your phone. Not use your phone while driving. Fucking every trying, single trying, trying to find things. Yeah. Ruin your life. Mm-hmm. And they kept calling me in for these interviews, and I was sitting there like, "Are you fucking serious?" In front of these two female cops, saying, "You're a detective. You can't detect." This is obviously she's motivated by the fact that I I fired her and she loves me and and, and I owe her a little bit of money. You can't detect this fallacy. This is insanity. You know, it, and because I'm a kickboxer and because I have a big mouth. They were right. so sure I was guilty. They just were desperate to lock me up. It was insane. I think I think a lot of that. A lot of that stuff comes from white knights who want to sort of teach an alpha a lesson, you know, like they want to they want to find some way to to defend Milady's honor. But also, uh, I think that there is uh, there's an aspect I, I, I tell guys this all the time. I say I think that there is a there's a quantifiable difference between a guy who's blue pill and he's beta and a guy who is blue pill. And he seems like he wants to think that he's alpha or he has some authority to sort of exercise over other guys. And these guys end up making the worst white knights or the worst amogs and, and will find ways to make your life as difficult as possible because they believe that if they do so, that it will endear them to women all over the world. Like if, if a woman is within shouting distance of, or you know, w- watching them go do something like this, even anonymously on an online chat, they will be happy to try to take you down a notch. They want to teach you a lesson, kind of thing. And bro. I think that gets into, I gets into a lot of the stuff you're talking about here, especially bro. when it's illegal. Yeah. Bro, man, you know, before this because this was my first genuine experience with the police. And I kind of had faith in the police system until this experience. But I'm t- when I tell you that those guys personally hated me, it was not a professional thing. They, they took my phones and laptops. They went through my shit. They thought this motherfucker has too much pussy. 
I'm, I can't stand this guy. Look at his Lambo and his chicks. He needs to go to damn jail. They, they didn't like me. Mm-hmm. And th- what you're describing is the police officers inside out. The little tech guy going through my laptop, seeing his dream girl over and over again. You know, all these different, you know, redhead, blonde, whatever. He's sitting there. He wanted me in jail more than anyone. Uh, the fact it took four years when I had nine witnesses and it was against word of mouth. It was insanity. It's just, it's just complete crazy land. And that's one of the reasons I left the West. When I realized that any woman who you've ever interacted with in your life ever can make up a lie 20 years later mm-hmm. and have you in a cell for two days while they raid your house and go through your entire personal life. So I ain't fucking living under this system. This is garbage. Yeah, I think there's a, I think there's a lot of guys who want to ing- ingratiate themselves, you know, with this Me Too thing. I, I'm, I'm glad we were going to – this was on our list too to talk about uh, Me Too. Uh, but I, I think that one of the re- – like we were ask- I was asking you before, why do people hate you? I think possibly it's because they see you being successful reproductively, see you being successful, and then like being proud of it. And uh, I think – I, I, I get this from guys. In, weird, weirdly enough, I get this from guys in the pickup artist community. But they'll say you need to kill your ego, and then yeah. here I see a guy like you who has a bit. I mean, no, it's no secret you have a big ego. That's and I don't. I don't necessarily see that as a downside most of the time, right? I don't see. I mean, I, I understand how it could be and how sometimes you need to sort of humble yourself. And but I think that they're like people want to. There's people. Like guys, particularly who think you need to kill your ego, and I, I think that that's probably one of the worst ideas I've ever heard. Or whether there's like even a way to do that, because uh, from a psychological perspective, it's almost impossible for if, if you kill your ego, you're going to kill yourself. You're not going to care about anything. Everybody has ego up to an extent. Now, how overblown that is, how you know, however that gets you into trouble, that's another another thing. But I think that. Being proud of what you do and being proud of who you are, and then using that as you know a source of you know personal pride. I don't necessarily see there's a, and there's there's a difference between being prideful and having me and being proud of yourself. And I, I, I think that's what really sets these guys off because there is there is you know there are incels, um, there are MGTOWs, there are MRAs, there are guys who see you. And they want to find a way to take you down. They want to find a way to affirm whatever whatever belief set they have, particularly when it comes to gender issues. But like, and in the case of maybe trad cons, it's it's a religious I- issue. Like, they want to find some way to sort of humble you or to to bring you down a notch. And the way that they do that is they align themselves with the feminine imperative. They they align themselves with with the police. I mean, so when a police when a policeman is has that as his mentality. Yeah. That is going, I mean, especially when it's something, I mean, that's, that's force. That, that's, in, that's the state enforcement. Well, if the guys believe in that, then, you know, then you have to move to Romania, I guess. Well, I mean, you know, I probably could have got away with, you know, staying in England, whatever, whatever, but I just didn't feel comfortable anymore. My, the, some of the interviews I had with, with these police officers, I made them look so foolish, like so ridiculously foolish. And the fact that it still took years to clear my case was insane. Like I can orate my, I can orate myself well. I can present myself well. I'm a smart person. You know, I'm a fighter, but I also have an intelligent side to me. Luckily, otherwise I, I might be in a cell right now if I, if I was a thug idiot. You know, even though I was still innocent. But I made them look so foolish with every single question that they couldn't even interview me anymore. Well, let me fact, let me let me throw this one out there because I know if I don't say this, somebody's going to put it in the chat or somebody's going to put it down in the comments here. There are going to be guys who are going to say. Don't you think the the risk is too much? Don't you think that the juice isn't worth the squeeze? You yourself have now even gone through a Me Too uh, episode or whatever. Uh, granted, you you were smart enough to get out of the United States yeah. and get away to Romania, but uh, a lot of guys would argue that maybe even in Eastern Europe, you're going to start seeing Westernized feminism and and yeah. the laws follow you over there. Uh, you're gonna see. You're gonna. I, I will guarantee you that at some point we'll have a MGTOW in the um, in the chat or in the in the comments here, say saying this is why you shouldn't deal with women whatsoever. Like this well, is I, why you shouldn't have a girlfriend. This is why you shouldn't. Well, you should never marry. But th- this is why that you should not have or minimize as much as possible your engagement with women. But it seems to me like you have 
kind of turn that around because that's the money you make. You you basically have a cam girl business. And so yeah. you're, you're kind of using that, the, the state of things to your own advantage. Well, so what would you say to guys who say it's, it's not worth it for, uh, it's too risky. It's too risky to engage yourself. I think that we're, first things first, Rollo, I'm going to eat while I'm on cam with you. That's I've got a steak. My, my girl. It's not an interview. It's just two guys talking. She was hiding in the background trying to be quiet while she brought me my food. So she like, you know, ruin the thing. So the truth is this, if you're a man and you want a happy life, you're going to need some degree of interaction with women. I don't believe there's any man out there who's completely happy to never have a girl ever. Like we're all red blooded males. Okay. Maybe I, maybe I overkill it, but you know, I have the ability to do that. I'm, I'm fortunate. So whatever, but I do believe you need a relationship with females, but you do need to be smart. I learned a lot from that whole scenario. I learned a shitload of, of uh, you know, I learned a lot and I learned a lot, especially about digital proofs and stuff. You need to be careful with what you text, what you say, you need to be very careful. And even in one of my, I have a, I'm not trying to plug or anything, but I have a dating course. I'm selling a product on how to get girls. And I, I explain that, you have to be careful with what you say because even things like I, I, they were digging when I was in my police interviews, they were digging up text messages saying, you said to this girl that she uh, better come over at nine. Why did you use the word better? Like literally like just like, oh, yeah, better you come at nine. Like they're trying to perceive threats that don't exist. They're trying to so you have to be so careful with now how you text, what you say. And that's why in the course I sell, I'm like, no, you have to do it this way. You have to do this. We have to do this way. So I've learned a lot. And I am fortunate being in Eastern Europe because none of that shit flies here. It's just not in the culture. There's no, there's no rape culture garbage. It's not taught. It's not thought of. No one really does it. A girl wouldn't stay around your house unless she wants to have sex with you because she understands that why the fuck would she stay around your house otherwise? They don't play those in-between games. Mm -hmm. It's not that kind of place. But I, I do think you need to have a healthy re interaction with women or you're never going to be fully fulfilled. Mm -hmm. So I think you just have to be careful of it. It's unfortunate but it's just, it's just the path you have to go down. You just have to be very aware of it, very careful, especially post, you know, and beforehand. And if you manage it carefully, you should be okay. I mean, the only reason I got caught up is because I threw her stuff out in the street and wouldn't pay her her money. So I guess. And, I, and this, and that happened, that. and this so, all happened in the United States. So, no, this and, in London. Oh, it did. Oh, this happened in London. Okay. Well, she's, yeah, yeah I, I, I don't think the UK is all that much better than a, the U S right. to, to those kind of laws. Yeah. Um, what I was going to say is, um, uh, but so in Romania, uh, let's just say for sake of argument, uh, you you said that there's no there's no rape culture there. Do, do do you think that the legislation there or that the government there expects women to behave like responsible adults? Because it seems like in the United States they don't like you know no, no woman is they're hypo agents right they're they're acted upon right they they want to be victims. So, you, so would you ex would you say that like Romania expects them to be you know responsible well, for their actions? Well, this is the thing with Romania. Romania is a poor country. Mm. So they don't have the police resource to be going down these rabbit hole garbage, four year investigations into nothing bullshit. They don't have the time. They ain't got the money. They ain't got the police. Mm. So in a poor country, people in, in general, not just in this sphere, in every sphere have more personal responsibility mm. in every sphere. So, and it's actually quite interesting how Romania has such a low crime rate compared to the West, even though the police are not nearly as equipped and they're not nearly as numerous still, just because people have the basics of family, and people are taught better. So I'll give you a quick example. In England, you, or same like America, you can't get alcohol without ID. You've got to show your ID, you're not going to get alcohol. Same in a club in London. You want to go to a club, you've got to prove you're 18, they scan your ID on the way in. And still after a couple hours, you're going to see some girl, too drunk, half asleep on a couch, about to throw up all over herself. In Romania, there's not even any ID checks. You can go to a club and see a 16-year-old girl, and she'll have one glass of wine, and she'll go home responsibly. And if you say, when I speak to these girls, I say, well, in England, the girls drink too much. They'll say, oh, yeah, but my dad will kill me. They still have the family unit mm -hmm. trying to hold and shit together, you know? They still, the, the mother and father got married in communism. You didn't split up in communism. You got together and that was it. Everyone's got those old school roles. And it's translated down to the women where the women understand they ain't going to sit there and drink all your drinks and play with your dick and go to your house and suck your dick and then start having sex with you and then say, no, I don't want to and try and call rape. It doesn't even cross their mind. They either want to sleep with you and they come with you, or they don't and they don't. Mm. They're just very sensible about it and they're very self-protective because they don't, they know the, and on top of that, it's corrupt. Like I'm, I'm an American, so I'd be fucked if I ever did anything wrong. But if a Romanian man, a rich Romanian man did something wrong to a Romanian girl and, the, and, they, and she called the police, 
They'll just give them all fucking $500 and they'll go away. It's a corrupt as fuck. So there is, it's just everyone's far more personally responsible, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. So and it that, just makes better. It so that, that kind of changes the adder. That, that's interesting how the, the, the socioeconomic status of that particular country contributes to the gender relations of just – the regular people that are there. Uh, there, there's a school of thought, and I, I actually happen to agree with it. Is that if uh, uh, you know the richer the country, the more it can afford to have feminism, the more it can afford to have things Absolutely. like me too. Mm-hmm. Bro, you, well, you just hit the nail on the head. The socioeconomics to the to the, the gender roles. That is perfect. You hit the nail on the head. The reason Eastern Euro- European women are so beautiful is not just genetic. It's that a lot of them understand my best chance at a good life is through a good guy. Yeah, they have you know, they're not going to go get some career and blah, blah, blah. It isn't, it ain't out here for them, you know? So they know their best chance at a good life is for a good guy. And they're like, well, okay, I thought you leverage my beauty to do that. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you something, man. An Eastern European woman, you know, I say it all the time, and Eastern European women will say this. If you cheat on me, I don't want to know. They won't say don't cheat on me. They'll say, well, just, I don't, just, I'll close my eyes. They won't check, they don't want to know. They kind of understand, well, if he pays my bills and, he, and, and he's taking care of me, then you know what? Whatever. Mm-hmm. They have a different mentality towards the whole relationship. But in general, and I don't say this because I'm some dude who's like come to Eastern Europe and I'm amazed by their beauty. I have beautiful girls in London. I've had beautiful girls all over the fucking place. It's not about looks. But their mentality is in general superior because the way they view relationships and the way they view the world is just a more intellectual it's a better, smarter view of things. And I and a lot of people have this impression that Eastern European girls are easy. They go, oh, if you have a little bit of money, they're easy, they're easy. I completely disagree. It is, a, it is 1,000 times easier to get laid in England than it is in Romania. The girls here are either looking to get married and like legitimately, because because the girls here see you to a degree, see you as a, a, pa- a financial path. Mm-hmm. So they don't want to just get fucked for nothing. They either want to marry you or they're going to charge you straight up in their hookers. There's like, there's no in between. Mm-hmm. They're either complete hookers <laughs> or they're like, okay, is this going to go somewhere? You don't going to get the girls like, oh, I just want sex. I like him. He's funny. He smokes weed and has no money, but he's funny. All that Western shit. None of that is here. They're all out there looking for the, okay, well, who's going to actually pay for my kids? Because if not, so my they're, they are still like, as far as hypergamy is concerned, there's alpha fucks and beta bucks. And I think that in the United States, we have sort of ensured that women get the beta buck side of the hypergamous equation settled for themselves, no matter what. But it sounds to me like over there, and we're probably in second and third world countries, the case is, is that they still need a man to provide in, the, in, that, in that respect. Uh, they still need the... Uh, they still need the money, first of all, and then second of all, they still need the uh, the emotional support and the you know the other things that go along with that. The masculine support. Now, I, I wanted to get into this too. Um, is you just did a spot with Alex Jones? What like last week? I think it was. Yeah. Uh, like, so uh, how did how did that? I, I know that the topic, and this is what I wanted to get to with you, is I know that the topic of that was like the state of masculinity, and I have been interviewed about exactly the same the same topic when as soon as I put out positive Matthew, the, the third book, as soon as I put out the third book, I, you know, people came out of the woodwork to ask me about that, but I, I kind of want to get an idea and for the people, just so the, I saw it, but just so the people who are watching this or who are in the chat right now, uh, what, what did you guys talk about with respect to like the state of masculinity? Well, my, the reason we, we spoke about it so, so fervently is that the breakdown of gender roles, which have existed for thousands of years, have broken down the family. And when you break down the family, you break down society. When you break down societies, you break down countries, and then you break down patriotism, and then you end up screwed. So it's it's the bottom, it's the tip of the iceberg, the breakdown of masculinity. People talk about issues like they're completely unrelated. The, the fact that there is an uh, invasion of, in Western Europe, the fact that there's an invasion in Western Europe of refugees, and there's no invasion in Eastern Europe, it's down to the roles of, of masculine males because when you have no warriors, you have no warrior class to resist, you're going to be conquered. The reason they get, the reason they go to Western Europe and do their shit and they don't do their shit in Poland or Russia is because they ain't going to get away with it. Mm-hmm. And that's the reality. So we were talking about, you know, the geopolitics of the earth, but it all starts with 
as you and I know, it all starts with the role of with gender roles of, of men and women. That's what that's the start of the whole thing. You can't discuss geopolitics. You can't discuss intercountry dynamics. You can't discuss refugee crises. You can't discuss any of that until you go all the way back and realize that men aren't being raised to be men and women aren't being raised to be women. And that's that's the very basics of it. And that's why we started there, because it's, it's absolutely and utterly true. You know, and it's crazy how fast we've de degenerated, you know, within living memory. You know, in the World War Two, there's people still alive from World War Two or whatever. And, and they are a complete different generation. And it's crazy. Yeah. And I still remember that. Well, the, re the reason I was talking about that is because I a lot of guys would like to say that, you know, we should just repeal the 19th Amendment, we should take away women's rights. And while I agree with that, I don't necessarily see that as being something that's feasible. But the other side of that coin is that men still need to find conventional masculinity. Repeal the 19th Amendment, we should take away women's rights. And while I agree with that, I don't necessarily see that as being something that's feasible. But the other side of that coin is that men still need to find conventional masculinity after that. It's, it's not enough just to take women's rights away. You've got to encourage men to become more dominant, more, more masculine, uh, rediscover what I call conventional masculinity. And coming back to that is I think the other side of, you know, kind of resetting things. Now, a lot of people are going to say, well, you know, just enjoy the, enjoy the decline. Shit's going to, shit's going to, happen and you know we're gonna have to build uh we'll rebuild from the ashes and i go well you're not gonna rebuild from the ashes unless you have guys who are going to be there and understand the nature of masculinity who understand that or the burden of performance who understand uh masculine dominance so it's one thing to say we're going to uh you know take away women's rights but still you still need a strong masculine base to well first of all to even initiate something like that but second of all it's like to to just function in a society now i don't think that that's just necessarily going to happen overnight if we just if we just decide to to uh to say okay ladies you know we're going to put you on ice you still need a class of men like oh, you were talking before i have a i have a great post um, and it's called, uh, well, it's, the first one was called War Brides. The second one was the War Brides of Europe. And I wrote the War Brides of Europe, I think in 2016, um, in response to a video uh, of uh, these guys, I think in Denmark, or not Denmark, uh, in uh, the Netherlands. And they were uh, protesting the, uh, the shootings, I think, that were happening in, in I think there is Islamic shootings in uh in France, and I think there might have been one also in the Netherlands. And what do these guys do? Is they put on? Oh, I don't know what it was. It wasn't the shootings. It was the the uh, the rise in rape, the 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 yep. you know the the percentage of rape has has gone through the roof. You know, in the last what four or five years, right? Which is coincides with with uh, the influx of, of refugees, right? Uh, we don't you know we don't see or we don't want to talk about that but the way that guys respond to that is they go and they put on high heel shoes and a skirt and they march in that because they want to show solidarity with with their sisters or with their girls and that that is the first thing that enters their mind yep. and that is to me that is a, a, a generation of guys who don't under like you were talking about a warrior class that they're gone there's, yeah. there's nothing there anymore. Societal collapse on every mm -hmm. level. Society's collapsed and there's no warriors left to protect them. And that's why these refugees get away with what they get away with. Mm -hmm. It's insanity. And, and you know, like, this whole gender dynamic to me, because, like you said, I, we talked about ego already, but we're, we're doing a candid interview. And to be candid, we need to be honest. Sure. I feel like I'm at the top of the tree. Like, I, I, I very rarely fail with any woman I want. That's the reality So from my side of it. But I hear a lot of guys say like, oh yeah, women just, you know, in hypergaming, they just want to fuck these guys. And I kind of completely get it. But then I say there are women out there who, who will fuck a guy who hasn't achieved all his life goals and whatever, whatever. And most of those women are sluts. Because I know plenty of sluts will fuck anyone. So it's like, well, on top of it, my view is very much, and I know this is easy to say from the top of the tree, but if you're a very average dude with very average game, any girl you're fucking is prepared to fuck average dudes with average game, mm. which means your the whole world becomes your competition. Like you got to worry when she goes to buy a KFC because that guy at the drive through might just be a little bit too slick mm -hmm. and, and take her number. Mm. Like, so my view to guys, I always say to guys is, yeah, 
women are a certain way. Yeah, it's annoying. But if you can identify it, and this is why your book's so great, if you can identify it and understand it, then what you need to do is position yourself in a way that you can use it against them, exploit them. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's no way you can have five girlfriends if you're not exploiting the game. Right. It's, it's, it's I mean, like, you know, knowing is half the battle. And yeah, they say knowing is half the battle. Well, you know, what's the, uh, what's, the, what's the other half? Violence. That's the other half of the battle. You have to be able to practice it. You have to be able to put it into practice and to use it to your advantage and learn from it. That's why I always say that the red pill is theory, whereas game is the practice. And one informs the other. And one is incomplete without the other. So, uh, yeah, I would, just to, to sort of uh, add something on to your point there, uh, yesterday I did a show with Pat Campbell for Red Pill 101, which is my other, my other show, um, and we were talking about hypergamy. It was, uh, I think we might even do another one because I, I feel like I didn't get enough, uh, I didn't get enough time to really sort of address the misconceptions, but I like what you just said because it sort of relates to one, is that guys will learn the game. They may be their average or maybe the somebody else and they see it as a straight jacket they see it as as something that is deterministic and i've always said that you know the the well the red pill but the hypergamy is not a straight jacket it's not something that is insurmountable in fact we used to do it all the time we would we would uh you know we had we used to I mean, even maybe even in uh romania this is a good example is that in in certain countries and certain cultures and certain religions we have to buffer for the base nature of, of men and women. And yep. I think that in the United States, we don't do that for women anymore. In fact, we, we encourage them not to be in, not to have self-control, not to police themselves over hypergamy. And, but I, I like what you said there is like, you know, guys get upset about that. And rather than using it to their advantage or trying to take that information and find some way to make it work for them, they just simply give up. You know, they just like, I, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. So I'm going to go and obsess over a cam girl, you know, <laughs> or, or, you know, or I'm going to uh, get a, a virtual wife of some sorts, you know, and like what you were just saying, is I, and I agree with you on this as well, is I think that there is an innate need in men to have a companionship with Absolutely. women, to, to be, a, you know, to have that as part of that. And so, you know, the juice might not be worth the squeeze, but you still want the juice. You know, you still want it. You, you wish it was, <laughs> but it might, it might not be to you, but you wish it was. And I think that guys need to understand this. And if you're in the chat and you're listening to this or you're, you know, for whatever reason, just don't, uh, guys call me to the carpet for this all the time. They'll say, well, you know, all you ever do is talk about hypergamy. All it is is, is hypergamy this and hypergamy. And, and I, I think that I, that you're, you're miss, you're pretty, you're misguided. And then you're misrepresenting what it is that I'm actually saying. Yeah. Um, I, it's, it's important to know how the game is played and then you got to go and play it. You said, uh, the, you said it perfectly. Know the, how the game is played. So I get this all the time. So, yeah, well, I, that's and that's what I kind of wanted to get. I, I'm getting sidetracked here, but that was kind of what I wanted to get into because you were talking with Alex Jones about the state of masculinity, mm -hmm. and and I, I I talked with Jesse Lee Peterson about this last year, and it, I, I think that there is sort of this new interest or renewed interest in in masculinity and conventional masculinity. Uh, I, I think we have been asking our men to man down for so long that yep. it sounds foreign to them when we say man up. Mm -hmm. And there's no authority that comes with the responsibility of having to man up in the first place. And I think that's where trad cons get it wrong. But, um, but I, I, I will say this, and then maybe you can confirm this, is like, especially in, I would say going forward from 2019, in through 2020 because we're now entering into an election cycle and that election cycle is going to be based on uh, gender politics. And I think it's gonna be even more so than it was with Hillary versus Trump. It's gonna be even more intense. Yeah. Uh, but I think that as a result of that, we're going to see a more intensified interest in what masculinity really is. I was yeah. just reading, a, uh, somebody sent me a, a tweet with a, with a link to uh, this study where I, I guess psychology departments want to put masculinity as a as a pathology they want to say traditional masculinity should be in the dsm the, the diagnostic and statistics manual for for um for psychology and we need to find ways to to 
tamp it down or to, to remove it entirely or to view it as if it's a sickness or a pathology of some sorts. And I think that the fact that that is even a thing in society right now, is it, I, I think it's completely the wrong way. And I think they're, they're completely, you know, I mean, the last, you know, 100,000 years has been based on what we would consider traditional masculinity. I don't like calling it traditional. I call it conventional masculinity because a lot of different guys have different traditions, right? But there are still unique aspects that are, you know, unique aspects of masculinity that are unique to males, to men. And yeah. I think that that is something that uh, the feminine imperative and maybe even other governments want to use as a way to control men because if they can control men and if we can make testosterone a poison and if we can make masculinity a bad thing then it or, or we can even though it doesn't even have to be bad it could be just something that is confusing to them it can be like guys i i, I you probably heard this too um and then i, I want to get to the to your your cam business here in a minute but i hear guys uh, on on sites or organizations like the Good Man Project, or uh, are we are we are man enough? And I forget the guy's name off the top of my. So sure, somebody will come up with it in the chat here in a minute. The guy's like he doesn't understand masculinity, so therefore it's a subjective thing, and he gets to define what it is. He gets to say what's strong and what's weak. He yeah. gets to say whatever. And basically, what it is is it's these guys defining masculinity to best fit themselves rather than having it be an objective set of circumstances and aspects that define a guy, right? That define a man as a masculine guy uh, that maybe even women are aroused by or women are attracted to. Um, you know, what is it about being a guy that is, that is arousing and attractive and what about that is inconvenient? And that's why I always say there's no such thing as toxic masculinity. There is only masculinity. And there are aspects of masculinity that are are inconvenient and are threatening to a female power base right now. And then there's the parts of masculinity that are good. So if a guy was, wants to go and save women from the rising floodwaters in Texas, then that's an okay, acceptable form of masculinity. Exactly. Exactly. Whereas if the guy, if the guy is, uh, you know, hanging out with his friends in the locker room and talking about girls or he's driving around his Lamborghini and saying, look at all the pussy I get, then that is an inconvenience yeah, or an inconvenient aspect of masculinity, but it's still part of masculinity. So there is no toxic masculinity. It's whatever the cultural narrative as at the time yeah. that is, it's either a useful part of it or it's not because the, the, the power base that we're in right now is gynocratic or gynocracy, gynocentris, uh, a female primary social order is what we live in right now. And there is a correct expression of masculinity and there is an incorrect, but um, just getting back to Alex Jones, do you see that there is a uh, a new a renewed interest in conventional masculinity right now like in mainstream culture i think people are starting to realize what's happening to masculinity and how how badly it's being damaged and this is what's so crazy like you said it with the rising floodwaters this is exactly right it's easy to sit behind a keyboard on twitter and talk shit about what masculinity should be mm -hmm. it's easy to sit in our societies in your safe little condo in new york and talk shit about masculinity. But in the, in the absolute realities of the human condition, when a firefighter has to run into a burning building, or when someone breaks into your house, or when nuclear war is struck, and there's, there's famine and savages on the street looking to stab you to death for your shoes, that's when you're gonna want masculinity all around you. Not just females will want it, us, uh, other men will want it. Mm. I want masculinity around me. Everyone wants, when shit hits the fan, Masculinity is the most important thing there is. And, and this is the reality that the only reason the human species lasted so long is because women could recreate and men are the ones who basically kept everyone alive. Right? This is the reality of it. So it's easy to sit in your condo with your Ikea furniture and your Starbucks and talk shit about masculinity, but in the extremes of the human condition, you can still see how important it is. Mm. So I, I know, when people say this garbage to me, I have a tweet I always repeat. And the tweet is, if someone breaks into your house, you're the man, you have to go down there and see who it is and face possible death. That's your job as a man. You hear a noise downstairs, you gotta go find out what's going on. If your girl won't even suck dick, what the fuck are you going down there for? And I do it. I do it to like poke at the fun of people go, oh, masculinity, oh, I'm a woman, I don't need to listen to you, oh, blah, blah, blah. But as soon as there's a bump downstairs, they ain't going down there. 
You know, they're, they're, oh, please, oh, I'm scared. So it's like, it's just fucking garbage. Uh, I think and, it was, um, it was uh, Jack Donovan. We, we, we were talking with him uh, in, I think it was the second, it might have been, I think it was episode 37 of the Red Man Group, what we did live at the 21 convention. But I, I thought that was a really important one with respect to this topic right here, because he said yeah. something to the effect of, uh, would you, if, if shit hit the fan, if we were in, like, say, the zombie apocalypse or whatever, uh, what guys would you want to be on your team to help you survive, right? What what guys would, you know, you look around the room and you say, that guy knows what he's doing and that guy doesn't. I mean, we have this kind of instinctual understanding as to, you know, and it, it doesn't necessarily have to be just straight up, you know, physical strength. It's also smart, you know, smartness and, and, and understanding how to how to work things out for yourself. I mean, there's there's that aspect as well, but... When we look and when we interact with guys, I think we we kind of have this innate idea as to, uh, I think instinctually we evolved to acknowledge or at least understand a guy who has more masculinity than the other guy does. And yeah. I think that's becoming even more apparent in the digital age because we are becoming even more connected right now. And, you know, we can be on Twitter and we're, we're, there's, you know, Twitter and, you know, 4chan and all really all of these social, you know, social media outlets. Uh, I think people are, are still kind of, they're, they're surprised, or at least they pretend to be surprised that human nature is the way it is. Yeah. And so we want to, or, you know, we, you know, guys like Jack from from Twitter wants to ban certain speech, right? We want to, oh, we want you to make it more civil. Well, that civility is only how well that person aligns with your own ideologies. The world but isn't civil. Sorry to interrupt. The world isn't civil. No, go ahead. Like, the, you had two blonde girls with their heads chopped off in Morocco. You had a, you had a guy yesterday on a train with his 14-year-old son stabbed nine times in the neck and killed in broad daylight in London. You don't want to talk about civility. This is, the world's a combative world. Civility is a, is a, civility is a, a, a mask. It's a thin veil that's on the top of society to stop people going full batshit. But the world's not civil. I've been to the world. I've been and I've seen the world. And I'll tell you for now, it's not civil. So when the idiots want to sit there and go, oh, feelings, oh, da -da, I want to just put them on a plane to Iraq and say, go live in Syria for a year and come back to me and talk about your feelings. People don't live in the real world. And when the real world punches them in the face, which it will sooner or later, they're the first people to have mental breakdowns. It's just, it's just crazy that people okay. think that you need to start policing speech. It's insane. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I also see in the coming future, I would say probably with at least within the next, next decade, maybe even sooner than that, uh, a lot of guys are saying that, you know, now we have – now that we have access to the kind of communication technology that we have today, uh, we've become the media. We are the media. We're the people who are coming out with this and, and talking about this kind of stuff, particularly when, you know, in my, from my, you know, neck of the woods, it's all about the manosphere, right? But that's, that's doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's limited to that. When you can watch a riot go on in France in real time on Twitter because somebody's right there with a cell phone and then go and see that same uh, that same riot on CNN later, and see how they uh, control the message and they control the narrative in that. When you know other things have happened there, when you know because you were there watching it firsthand with a guy with a cell phone, uh, I think we're going to see in the in the coming future here <clears throat> that the the mainstream broadcast news and the the mainstream outlets in and of which i would consider you know twitter and some of these other social media outlets i would say that these guys know that it's going to get out of their control and so what they're trying to do right now is they're trying to control that and they're trying to that's why people are getting deplatformed that's why they don't they don't want that message to get out there because it's too easy now it's too easy to see the truth it's too easy to have boots on the ground with like i said with a with a cell phone that's why i have a, i have a lot of respect for, I, I don't know if you're familiar with tim pool but he i have a lot of respect for that guy because he gets out there and he he puts his ass on the line to go and get the get the story right and yeah. I think that watching him and then watching something like CNN later, I think right now people are sort of waking up to uh, understanding just how misinformed they've been for, you know, maybe the last 20 or 30 years. Yeah. Yeah. We're, 
And it was right. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I, the reason I wanted to bring up uh, this new interest in masculinity is because I think that there, you know, there's, it's been described as there's this generation of what we call the lost boys, right? Yeah. They're, they're, they're young men who have been uh, brought up in a feminine centric social order. Um, they have e had either beta fathers or non-existent fathers, or they've had um, they've had no real inf no real uh, role model in a positive, conventionally masculine way for them to really understand themselves as men. And so, as a result, these guys are looking for something. They're they're hungry for this. They're hung that's one of the reasons I think that Jordan Peterson is so. Uh, influential right now. I, I, I'll, I'll reserve my opinion for, of, of J, uh, JB for uh, JP for this episode, but I think that he was smart in that he realizes that there is a generation of, or actually probably two generations of uh, young men who are looking for regimen. They're looking for uh, um, they're looking for some kind of root, know, routine, but they're looking for some kind of organization or some something to follow. Um, yeah. Because they never have that, and they don't know what to do with themselves. They don't know what masculinity is. They don't know. Um, they don't know the direct. But first of all, they're kind of you know rudderless in life. But that, and that's one of the reasons why when he when he comes out with a book called you know Twelve Rules for Life, it's, oh here's a list. Of, here's some things I can follow. Now, you know, I'm not going to say one way or the other uh, about that right now. But I will talk about the interest in that, and I think that one of the reasons why you're successful right now really is because there's a generation of guys who are so desperate for that human contact and they're yeah. so desperate for that engagement with a woman that they don't realize how to go about that in real time they only know yeah. how to do it virtually they only know how to how to set you know like we were just talking about before we came on here we we're talking about the thought audit right mm -hmm. and i yeah, i always thought i thought this was kind of really interesting because it's like you've got these guys who are very you know embittered dudes who are uh, trying to find some way to hit back at, uh, you know, these cam whores, like yeah. the, the Snapchats and the, the Snapchat premium Snapchats and all that, you know, that kind of stuff where they're just basically not even, it's not even porn really. I mean, it is porn, but it's not really porn in the traditional sense in that they'll show you like, you know, a crotch shot or they'll, sh they'll take a picture of their ass for you and you'll pay $29 for it. I mean, you understand how this works, but <clears throat> there's a, there's a generation of guys who are just so thirsty and so desperate for that. And the other thing we were talking about is it's not just guys though. It's also women. Uh, women are, because they realize that we have isolated ourselves as genders and polarized ourselves as genders uh, with laws like me too. And yeah. having this, you know, lack of understanding of how the other gender operates or what the, what the nature of women is and what the nature of men is. And we have the, um, uh, that service right now, somebody, somebody sent me this link, this service of, um, cuddling, right? So like a chick can call a guy and, and the guys look probably exactly as you would imagine them to look. And they're, you know, they come to the door and it's like, okay, you're going to pay for half an hour. It's almost like a massage, but you're just going to sit there and you're just going to cuddle and you're going to spoon or something. And then when the time's up, the guy picks up and leaves, right? At least that's the idea. Now, I think that's, that is fraught with all kinds of, of dangers, especially in the era of me too. I don't see why guys would do that, but I, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no substitute for it. You know, you have to have that touch. You have to have that keno. Uh, right. And I think that there's this real, there's this real desperation for like a connection with another human being. And we, we build up Twitter and we build up social media as if it's this great extroversion when in fact, it's very much an introversion. Yeah. Um, but I think that the lost boys generation is really desperate for this. I, 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 I hate to say that, you know, what I do is, is sort of, I, I like to think that at least I'm helping in that, in that respect. I understand that these guys are out there and they want to know this kind of stuff. And thank you for that super chat. That's the first one I've got. <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay. Yeah. Uh, weekly narrative. Thank you for that. I have to recognize those. Um, I think we're getting up on the two o'clock hour here, uh, which is midnight for you, right? Yeah, uh, well, we, you can keep going. Okay, I think what I'm going to do now is, and I've come up on an hour. We'll, I'm going to open up. If you guys have, if you guys have questions for myself or or Tate here, uh, please just go ahead and put them in the uh, in the in the chat. Um, if you get super chats, that's great. But you don't don't feel like you have to. Uh, but I, I just kind of wanted to open it up to to guys. So one of the other things I wanted to talk about 
Well, actually, I should ask you this. What did you think of the of the thought audit? I really wanted to get your your input on that because that's kind of hits you in your pocketbook, really. I mean, if these guys really wanted to hurt these girls, they could just turn it off, right? I mean, they could just stop their subscriptions to to all of this. But thank you for the super chat there. I appreciate you too, my friend. Uh, blockchain in the Google killer <laughs> is the Google killer. Uh, anyways, um, what did you think of the thought audit? Yeah, I, I mean... So there's two ways to look at it. First things first is I am like some of my views are all over the place. I like to consider myself a red pill guy, but I, I do look both sides of the equation. And I know this is easy for me to say because I have a cam business, but I understand why the girls do webcam. Male attention, these guys are so fucking thirsty and they'll throw money at you. Like if I was a chick, would I do webcam? Probably. Like, what the fuck? You, what are you going to do? For, for now, yeah, a thousand dollars? Like, you're going to blame her for doing it when the dude's desperate to give her his money? Like, I'm, I'm like, well, fucking yes. The dude wants to give it to you. Take it. So that's that. But the guys were just, the guys were just bitter. No, they didn't give a fuck about hey, the, the IRS. No one gives a shit about the IRS. These are just bitter guys, you know? And. Okay, maybe the girl is not paying her tax, whatever. She's a chick. The fucking girl said not to pay. They're just ignorant. <laughs> She's taking pictures of her titties. She ain't thinking about fucking tax forms. She's thinking about, you know, doing that and buying some perfume. But I don't think the guys were doing it with any, even though I agree everyone should pay tax, I don't think the guys were doing it with any kind of noble cause. They were just pissed off at hot chicks, you know, not, not getting the, not being able to fuck the girls they're in love with. And I've seen it time and time again. I've seen how bitter guys can get when they get obsessed with a girl and they don't and they don't get her in the end. It, it can become real. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it many, many times. But it's a difficult world for most men. I mean, my personal situation is I wasn't born a somebody. Mm -hmm. I think I was acutely aware of all of this at a young age. Like I knew I needed to become successful and become a kickboxer and and get money and that I knew all of these things from a very young age. And I even I remember being 17, 18, seeing a Ferrari on the street and being like, fuck, I need to get one of them. I just kind of knew inside. Mm -hmm. and, and I knew it and it's worked out for me. That's all great. But now I use hypergamy against women completely because I know that they'd rather share an alpha than have a hundred percent of a beta. Right. I know that even though they may sleep with me and then cry their eyes out the next day because I'm with some other girl, but I know they're not gonna leave. Mm -hmm. I use it against them completely. So I've just flipped the script. So, you know, that that's, that's good. I, I got a question here to say, how do you develop frame? How do you, like, I, I'm, if you've read my book or if you've actually listened to some of my past interviews, I, I talk about frame quite a bit, yeah. but actually I think I want to talk to you about that. Um, when you were younger, like, how did you get from where you are, where you were then to where you are now? I mean, what, what aspects of your personality did you have to change? What did you, what did you have to sort of accept that was, you know, that was part of you establishing a world that other people, you know, I always say that women want to, want to, uh, they want to get with a guy that other guys want to be and other yep. women want to fuck. Right. Yep. Yep. And so how did you go from being that 17 year old kid wanting that Ferrari to being 32 years old where you're at right now? I think or what, I, ha what did you have to change? Yeah. I mean, I, I've had girlfriends and split up with them and been upset and heartbroken like everyone else, but I never became bitter. And, and, and I, it never really bothered me too much. And I think one of the ways I learned all I learned, because so everything I know about women, I've learned just through experience, but I've never really, I'm, uh, it's not like I have a real bad story. It's not like I was married and divorced and then I learned. It's not like I went online and was heartbroken and Googled and then I learned. It was none of that because I always had a higher purpose and my higher purpose was fighting. If you always have a higher purpose, then a woman can never truly control you. And she can never can truly destroy you. And your frame can't be broken. If I had to go train for a fight and the girl was complaining, well, then she could fuck off and leave. Because I ain't getting my ass kicked for nobody. Not you or no one else. I had to go fight in front of 10,000 people. So I don't care if it's your birthday. I'm going to the fucking gym. So I always had a higher purpose. And that allowed me naturally to build a frame where I learned that it's better to never submit. And that relationships are happier if I never submitted. And that I was always just steadfast to who I was and being and doing what I wanted to do. But things worked out better in the end anyway. But I learned all that kind of on accident because I just refused to, to bend and obey to all the women I was with. I'd get a girlfriend and she'd be like, oh, you train four hours a day and it's my birthday. Or I used to go to the gym on Christmas. Mm -hmm. It's Christmas. I don't give a fuck. I'm busy. 
So I always kind of had that. So I kind of learned everything I knew by just being preoccupied with something completely separate. Mm -hmm. And it was something that took a lot of my time and 100% of my concentration. So that's kind of where I learned my frame. And now even when I stop fighting, my frame's the same. I believe the most miserable existence on earth is living a life pretending to be something you're not. I really believe it. And that's why I don't for a second hide what I do or apologize to anybody. If you look at what I do and it offends you, you that the, the hate is inside of you. The hate ain't inside of me. You need to go look in the mirror and deal with your own problem. I don't give a fuck. I don't care. And I'm the same with women. If, if, if you get with me and then you start complaining about how I am, you better fucking leave because I, I'm it sounds, it, it, it sounds you know? to me, and, and and this is something that I stress. I actually had another uh, another uh, question in here about like what is the one thing that you think people need to know, especially when it comes to the rational male or my book or whatever, um, or really as it per pertains to frame as well. Um, one thing that I think most guys, particularly in this you know, feminine centric culture are, mm -hmm. it's almost bred out of them to make themselves their own mental point of origin. If there's a single most important aspect of becoming red pill, it's making yourself the center of your, you know, your, of your thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's not just some mindset bullshit. Okay. That is what I mean by that is that when I talk about mental point of origin and I, this, I think it's in the second book as well. Um, I mean that you need to be the first thing that comes to your mind when I, when you make a decision. Like, how is that decision going to affect you? Now, it's easy if you go and you say, well, I'm going to go down and buy Taco Bell today. Okay, well, whatever. You know, I'm not talking decisions like that. I'm talking about, like, life decisions of what you're going to do, who you're going to be. Uh, how is, uh, you know, like, say, how is, like, a, well, just for sake of example, how is a career change going to affect you? Rather than, oh my God, my career is going to change. How's this? How is my wife going to see this? How are my kids going to deal with this? How are my? How's my mom and dad going to deal with this? Yeah. And I think that because we live in a femme-centric society, and men or boys, I should say, are brought up as if they were defective girls, they are given a female-specific education. We try to teach boys, as it like it said, as if they're defective girls. But as a result of that, it gives us a uh, it, it knocks ourselves off of that pedestal we always say you know you take the woman off the pedestal right well what you need that well, i agree but i think that in our upbringing and our acculturation we tend to to put womankind as our prospects uh, or as this you know the the thing that we should be thinking about the correct way of thinking is how a, how a woman would feel or putting womankind as the first thought in our heads our mental point of origin we are taught to do that at a very young age and i think that that's probably one of the most difficult aspects guys encounter when they unplug and when they when we say okay you know uh, i i'm red pill aware and what do I do now? Well, first thing you need to do is you need to internalize this idea that you come first. You are self-important. That doesn't necessarily mean you're selfish. It just means that you are, you are, you come before anything else in your thought process. Because for a very long time, probably since you were about five years old, you've been taught to put womankind as the first part of that thought process. Yeah. You're supposed to think about how mommy will think. You're yeah. supposed to carry the girl's books home from school. You're yeah. supposed to be nice to her. You're supposed to be supportive. You're supposed to have, oh, you're supposed to get in touch with your fem your female side, right? You're supposed to uh, put womankind as your first order of thinking. Yeah. And guys, and this is one of the reasons why I tell guys, it's like, you know, unplugging guys from the matrix is dirty work. And it's like triage because they can't do that. That's the biggest hurdle for them to do is to make themselves their most important thought. Now, it isn't to say that you don't think about other people. You do. You, I'm sure you, just like me, have other people in your life who depend on you for lots of things. Absolutely. And they, they, in, they become you know, people who are dependent on you. And they become people who, who, if your decisions are one way or another, it's going to affect their lives as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so... What I do is I practice what's called enlightened self-interest, which is I can't help anyone before I help myself. You can't I, can, I cannot help anyone as well as when I help myself first.
Yep. That's like when he, and just, I've used this a million times. It's like when, when the oxygen mask falls out of the, you know, you're sitting on a plane and the oxygen mask comes down, they tell you to put it on yourself first and then put it on your kids or whoever that you assist with later. Because if you can't breathe, you're dead and you're, you're going to kill the rest of those people with you too. If you don't help yourself first, it's basic. It's a, it's a very fundamental ideology, but I think it's interesting that we've lost sight of that, particularly for men and particularly for boys today, because we, when, when a boy acts like a boy, when we, we, we drug him, we sedate him, we say, you're not learning like a girl. So therefore we need to give you medication. So you will look like a girl, or we, you will look like, well, you will act like a girl. We, um, we want to make sure that you are going to behave as we want a sweet little girl to behave and you're going to learn like that and you're going to we're, they're basically teaching generation after generation and i should say that this isn't just for the last two this is as far back as uh like the 70s and maybe even the 60s where we're teaching boys to be more feminine we, we we've talked about this probably a million times on on red band group but it's like there's a a definite feminization of society that's been going on for at least the last 50 years. And I think that as part of that, there is almost a social engineering aspect of it that teaches boys to think of others first, right? To, to make sure that you're a good servant, to make sure that you're going to be that perfect beta guy at 30 years old when the girl gets off the cock carousel and now she's ready. You know, that's why women say, wait for me. You're such a great guy. Uh, let's tell you what, let's, 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 uh, let's agree that if we're both single at 30, that we'll get married, right? That kind of shit. Um, I think that that is the fundamental aspect of developing frame is if you, if you want to develop a frame, I think you did this as well. When you were 17, you had to come first and maybe your dad, maybe is, would you say your dad kind of put that into you? Yeah, I, I certainly was raised that way. Um, fighting is a selfish sport. You have to come first. I was lucky to have a father like I had who raised me that way. So I, I always pretty much put myself first and I, I never really did otherwise. Um, and I saw how beneficial that was to my life as a whole. Mm -hmm. I, I would never have what I have now. if The woman was in charge of my destiny. This no is, all right. I got a, I got another question here. This is a $10 super chat. Thanks brother. Uh, this says, what's your payment structure for cam girls? Do you get a percentage or pay them hourly and keep it all? That's a good question. That is and, good question. Uh, uh, I should say I have a course on this. Go buy it. So I should say. <laughs> but, um, uh, it depends. It depends on the unique situation with the girl. It, it can all work out. It depends how it goes. Um, but in my experience, girls aren't motivated by money. Women are not money hungry like a man is. They're not money motivated. Like money is a way to motivate them, but there's far better ways to do it. And I think if you, you can motivate a woman with attention and with love and with making her feel special and affection far more than you can with money. If you were to go to a girl and say, look, you know, we'll do a business deal, blah, 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 blah. Like, look, okay, let's, okay, let's, let's take away from camera. Let's look at street pimps. Mm -hmm. And one of, my, one of my best friends, he's on my Instagram. He has a, he's a, he's literally a street pimp. That's what he does. He's a fucking million dollar Lamborghini from street girls. Mm -hmm. And you ask a street pimp, how much the girl keeps? 0%. The, the pimp gets it all. And people are like, why would a girl work and give all her money away? Well, it's because she wants the attention and validation of that man. That's why. So it, that's, that's the perfect example of how it's very little to do with money and, and percentages and all that thing. It's about, I want this man to be happy with me. Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of the, the game comes in. But you're only going to pull that off if she respects you immensely. Mm -hmm. And she's only going to respect you immensely if you respect yourself immensely. If you treat yourself like shit, why is she going to treat you any better? You know? I think a lot of guys presume that if you are a pimp, digital or otherwise, that that girl is in some way dependent on you. Um, like, do you, would you say that your girls are, I mean, are any of them on drugs or anything like that? I mean, do they have to, um, do, are they dependent upon you for anything other than maybe attention? Oh, I absolutely, I, I would actually absolutely disagree with that. And that's a common conception mm -hmm. because if, if you have girls on the street and they're addicted to drugs, cause that's what everyone says, oh, he gets them hooked on drugs. That means they become a drug addict and that means they need money for drugs. So how can you trust her to bring you all the money if she needs drug money? Mm -hmm. You can't. Maybe you'll get a girl on the street because she want because she initially wants drug money. But the first thing a pimp's going to do is clean her up because otherwise she has a habit and she ain't worried about work. She's worried about her habit 
and she's been getting money. She ain't going to give it to you. She's going to keep some and all this garbage. So you don't want her dependent on anything else. Mm-hmm. It really is just a matter of, and also you can't force someone to do anything over any serious period of time. Whether it's a street girl or a webcam girl, if they want to leave and they have the ability to make their own money, what's stopping them leaving? Right. Like what's stopping them just going out the next day and making money by themselves? Just going and doing it. Yeah. Well, I I would I would presume that most of the girls that work for you don't really have the know how to do anything other than to be flirtatious and to be you know on camera all the time. I, obviously, I don't. I would say they probably don't know how to set up a website and how to do it themselves. I think one of the things that instagram and snapchat does is it makes it almost too easy for for girls to actually set up their own you know sort of pimping themselves their own digital prostitution in that in that respect in my my view in my view many even even in that angle girls don't want to do it on their own Mm -hmm. they want that male support and also they want that validation that what they're doing is a woman is so much happier to do that kind of thing if there's a man at the end of it all who goes who gives a shit what other people think of you? You're mine. I love you. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, there is still something that triggers in them that they feel a bit guilty or, you know, there's still something about it that bothers them. Mm-hmm. I'm telling you if, you, if you see a girl with a premium Snapchat and she's got fuckloads of guys messaging her and she's on Twitter and she's advertising it and she's happy as fuck, it's only because there's a dude dick in her right. Mm-hmm. If she didn't have a man, she wouldn't be content doing that. That's, that's the reality of the situation. It's the whole dynamic of... of we can talk about it in a web sphere, but even I, I always go back to the street because it's the most raw version. There's always been pimps and people have always said, well, what's the pimp's role? Why would you need a pimp? And the reality is because it makes the woman feel better about what she does. This is the reality of it. You know, she feels happier doing what she does when she has a man to report to in some sense. Mm-hmm. That's just, that's just a, the natural dynamics of uh, a pimp. The pimp game is just gender roles, hyper, the man, the woman, subservient. It's just hyper gender roles, just super extended to the point where the woman's just like, I have to obey to please this man. I will do as this man says. He's the only man I really, truly love. But it's just, it's just, it's just an extension of that. Mm-hmm. It's just playing on the natural human nature of, of, of people. I, you know, it's interesting you should say that because I think that a lot, and this has been my experience from when I was writing the first book and actually when I was, was writing, uh, not even on my blog, but all the way back when I was a moderator on SoSwab, is there are, I, I remember reading like the game, right? And I remember uh, reading some of the stuff like Mystery Method was doing and all fastest seduction and, and that kind of stuff at the time. And I remember being able to sort of make the connection between like the psychology that I was learning at the university at that time and what it was that these guys were doing because I was studying behavioral psychology then. And it was fascinating to me because pretty much what you've broken down I could probably dissect that in, in, in psychological terms, but we kind of have this natural understanding of it, or we have this kind of instinctual feel of, of what, you know, what the dynamics between a conventionally masculine dominant male is and what a, a submissive passive feminine female is. Uh, one, one thing I, and this actually, this would be a, a question myself is what do you think about, pickup artistry would you would you call yourself a pickup or have you ever considered yourself a pickup artist no i won't um first thing before i answer that question there's a guy here who asked a question fahid fahid sure. but yeah yeah we can do that I, if you want to yeah. read it yeah i sell a few courses i sell a course on how to get girls because i believe i've invented a system that makes it quick and easy for absolutely everybody so i met a system on how to get girls and i do sell a webcam course Mm-hmm. Complaining of when they says, well, why, how can you sell a cam course to complain about the decline of the West? I can't fix the West. And it's not my prerogative to fix the West. I'm an observant. I've observed the problems with the West. If there's a whole bunch of men spending billions of dollars on chicks, if I can get a percentage of it, I don't see why I shouldn't do that. I don't have any moral obligation against doing that. That's my short answer. Mm-hmm. But in regards to being a pickup artist, I have never considered myself a pickup artist for two reasons. One, I rarely actually approach and I'll, I'll approach a girl if she's a 10. And when I say 10, I mean a real 10. I have a load of guys go, she's a 10. And I look and I go, bro, that's not 10. My 10 is 10. I'm talking about 2 million Instagram followers, like 10. So I'll approach a 10. Otherwise I don't really approach that often. It's not really, it's not, it's not like I'm not a day game guy. I don't go out and chase every chick I see and sit around the mall waiting for them to walk past. I'm not that dude. I'm busy. I got shit to do. So now, like, now, just w- quickly to interrupt you here, I, I apologize for this, but 
it wasn't but a few months ago that you were like dating some like super hot ass chick who was like had some sort of uh, was she a model or was she somebody who was just like an Instagram model or something like that? Yeah. So what Instagram, was that all about? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, she's, she was on, ended up on Dan Bilzerian's boat and everything. <laughs> I, think I, sent you, I think I sent you the inbox as the first thing. Hey, you don't care about me. You, 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 don't, you don't message me. And then she tried to go all away with Dan as if I'm going to give a fuck. I don't know. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, this is what I mean. So if there's a girl on that level, I'll approach her. But in general, I don't, I don't really, really approach. And another thing that I, I do is that, and this is why I teach in my course as well, a lot of pickup guys, I'm about to rip into Roosh in a second. So if you're a Roosh. Yeah, okay, go right ahead. <laughs> but if, 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 if you're a lot of pickup guys, their whole life is get a girl, fuck a girl, get a girl, fuck a girl, get a girl. I, I am actually go beyond that. And I know with my social media, I look like that guy. I just want to fuck lots of girls. I believe in being respected and loved and taken care of. And I like genuine relationships with girls. I would much rather have one or two girls who would wait for me through a prison stretch than a whole bunch of random hoes. So what I teach is far more about, very similar to what you teach, isn't about just getting a girl and fucking her. How do you have a happy relationship where she genuinely respects you? How do you have a relationship where she will stand by you? How do you have a genuine love and the genuine, uh, the genuine gender dynamics in a relationship that makes sure she's happy and you're happy? So I've never been a pickup guy because I've never wanted a hundred. I've slept with a lot of girls, but I've never been the guy who goes, I need to fuck 10 girls a week. Otherwise, I don't give a shit. I I'm happy to get a one good one and retain her. What I'm good at is getting a, a beautiful woman and retaining her mm -hmm. and then getting another one and retaining her. And I'll have five or six at once. All yeah. of which. So spinning beautiful. plates, right? Yeah, <laughs> pretty much oh, exactly what I was saying. Genuinely about. beautiful and they all genuinely love me. And they'll, uh, so that's what I'm interested in much more than going out fucking a girl. Going out fucking, I could do that, but it's not really my thing to be honest. I, I'm much happier knowing that if I have a problem, I can call a girl and say, "Look, I need you to fly here and do this." Right. And they, okay, anything you want. I, that's what I want, and that's what I teach in my course as well. Like, yeah, getting the girl, fucking the girl is the first ten percent of the game. Having a girl tattoo your name on you, on her, yeah, is the other ninety percent. And how many girls? How many girls have their have your name on them now? 22. I got 20. I'm on 22. 22. Oh man, there's guy. There's guys watching this right now. Is going to run into one of those and then go, "Oh my god." <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure a couple of them are covered up by now. There must oh, be. that's it's funny. Been a while. No, I mean, gosh, that's that's something that you want to talk about ownership. There you go. Well, uh, this thing, I, I just say to the girl, like, "Are we going to be together forever?" She goes, mm -hmm. "Well, I hope so." I said, "Well, I don't believe in hopes. It's yes or no." She goes, "Well, I, well, I want to." So if you genuinely want to, then why wouldn't you get a tattoo? Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I think a lot of, and, and I, I'm going to get to this other question here in just a second, so bear with me, but um, I think a lot of guys, a lot of guys think that I wrote the books that I wrote so that it would help pick up artists. Yeah. And does it? Sure, it can. It can be, be part of that, but I didn't write it specifically for the pickup artists to do that, right? A lot of it was inspired by conversations that I had with some, some pickup artists. Um, so am I, a, am I a proponent of PUA? Um, in a way, yes. In a way, no. Uh, it just depends on, on what it is we're talking about. Uh, is Rolo Tomasi a MGTOW? No, I'm not a MGTOW, but I agree with a lot of what they have to say. I think that they have the analysis absolutely almost 100% perfect. Yeah. Uh, I think that I, I only disagree with their solutions. I, I don't agree with their, or I don't disagree with their analysis. I think they, like I said, they got that right. Uh, am I an MRA? Well, if you listen, if you read any any of my haters on, on uh on Twitter, you, people will, I, I think that's funny because like the first thing, the first criticism that anybody has when, when you throw something like, like uh, red pill awareness at someone, they think you're an MRA because that, that's the only designation that they know. That's the easy name that they, they can remember. Oh, you're just an MRA. Am I an MRA? No, I'm not an MRA. It's certainly not. I think MRAs get it wrong when it comes to egalitarian equalism. I think mm -hmm. that they still want to have an equal uh, they they want to be more perfected feminists is what they want to be. They want to have uh, rather than having a complementary relationship with a woman, they they believe in the lie of feminism, which is that we can have an egalitarian uh, relationship with women. I say that's an, that's an impossibility simply because there's no such thing as equality. Yeah. Uh, so that's where I disagree with them. Although I would say that they in in some senses they have at least made they have at least raised awareness to. Uh, to red pill 
topics. So I, I got to at least give them that. So is there some bad and there's some good? Yeah, there's some bad and good. Uh, am I a trad con? Absolutely not a trad con. But I understand why certain aspects of morality exist because I understand the latent purpose behind that. You know, when guys say, well, you know, I'm not going to have sex until I get married, you know, the premarital sex thing, or I, I understand why you want to do that. I just don't think that that is, a, I think that's an impracticality in this yeah. day and age right now. I think that a lot of trad cons believe in this man up script. That is exactly the same thing as feminism. It's mm -hmm. we, we need men to man up. We're going to tell men to man down all the time, but, we want to tell them to man up when we need them to. Like I was talking to you about how, how masculinity is a, it's a convenience to them. It's like they want the parts that are, are convenient and that are uh, helpful to them. And they don't, and they, anything else is, is toxic. And we're getting to the point, I think, right now where uh, a, lot of, a lot of SJWs simply want to call masculinity, at, no matter what it is, they want to say masculinity itself is toxic. And I think we're coming to that point very yeah. soon. And what I would say is, you know, tra Mr. Tradcon, what do you, what are you going to do about that? You know, how are you going to, Im how are you going to give men authority if they have, you expect responsibility? Well, there needs to be an exchange there. And why don't they have that authority as well? That would be my, my, my saying for them. Now, the reason I'm bringing all of this up is because I got this question here. It says, uh, Rolo, please speak to the coming societal shift, uh, like, a hip trend towards men being red pill slash MGTOW, which started as an underground movement and is now growing into the mainstream. Um, did, let me ask you this. Do you think that red pill awareness and I mean, you, you just got, uh, you just got done with uh, Alex Jones yeah. uh, talking about issues of masculinity. Uh, I would say that there's definitely a, an interest in it, but do you think that it's going to go mainstream? Do you think that it's coming, it's going to be hip or you know, trendy to be red pill or to be MGTOW or to be MRA or any of those you know classifications. I just I I don't really I, I'm not sure. The problem with with red pill, true red pill, is that you have to take on a whole bunch of personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. and, and and we can look outside of the dating sphere and understand that people uh, absolve personal responsibility every chance they get. Mm -hmm. If you want to be truly red pill, you have to be personally responsible for a lot of shit. You got to be like okay. I understand how women work, so I need to get in fantastic shape. I need to get my finances together. I need to have an iron frame. I need to not chase a chick if she gives me attitude. I have to you know, tell a girl to fuck off for the smallest indiscretions, or I'm not going to train her to behave herself around me. You've got to have a lot of mental discipline to truly understand red pill. And I don't think people have mental discipline. That's mm -hmm. the truth. Yeah. I think people, a lot of people lack it. And this is why blue pill exists. If you believe in the fairy tale, you don't need mental discipline. I don't need to get I don't need to get in shape. I don't need to be a man of value. I don't need to do X, Y, Z, all these hard things because oh, because I'll meet a girl and we'll just click. It's just, I think it's just a lot of it's just absolving responsibility. Mm -hmm. Just take on a red pill mindset. You have to be responsible for your shit. Yeah, blue, you pill, blue pill thinking is magical thinking, is what it is. Yeah, it's magical thinking. And I mean, I, I completely understand why I get away with what I get away with. I'm a millionaire fucking athlete. Well, duh. But, you know, so I'm not, when I, like even my course what I sell, I have people who say to me, why is a millionaire athlete teaching us how to get girls? Well, it's easy for him. No, because even like your book, it teaches you the rules to the game. I look at things from a chess, I was raised in a chess family. My dad was a chess master. So from in a, on a chess board, even if you're losing, you can still make the best possible moves to give yourself the best possible position. So even if you're not in the best physical shape, even if you're not a millionaire, whatever, you still need to know the rules to the game to make the best possible moves to get the best possible outcome. Mm -hmm. You can still do fantastically, and there's not a person alive who would read your book and not do better or buy my course and not do better because we're teaching them the rules to the game. Most people out here don't even know the fucking rules. And they're just moving pieces at random and wonder why their whole life's fucked up. Right, like, or, or they jump on the uh, success porn train and they hold pep rallies rather than actually giving anybody any kind of actionable information. Exactly. Yeah. And, and another thing with women, I mean, one thing we did talk about the PUA, I do actually think, I mean, I've had a few guys inbox me saying, what should I do? I'm 18, 19. I do think there is an important period in a man's life where you do need to sleep with a lot of women. And I don't think it's, so I think in the modern world nowadays, if you want to find a good woman, you ain't going to find a good woman on your first try. I, I really believe, like, I, I, I understand the game inside out. 
And I've fought some girls and afterwards thought, you know what? She's just more hassle than she's worth. She's already broken or she's just a fucking pain in the ass. Or she has, you know, you sometimes I said, I use apples as an example. If I were to say to you, go out there and find the best apple you can. And you only, and you'd only viewed two apples. Well, what do you know about apples? If you, if you, if you have a hundred apples to choose from, you're going to come back with a really good one. Mm-hmm. So people go to me, Tate, how the fuck do you get a 10 with your name tattooed who lets you cheat? Who does anything you say? It's like, well, I fucked 500 girls to find her. So that's part of it. It's not just who I am. It's also, there's a numbers game to this element as well. So I do think as a man, you also have to be in, in 30, 40 years ago, not so much. But nowadays, if you want to find a quality woman, you're going to have to tear through some shitty chicks to get one. Mm. And this is why I teach. I, when guys say to me, Tate, you're declining the West because you're teaching guys to fucking dump girls in your course. I'm saying if you want to be happy as a man and you want to have a, a good relationship nowadays, you better learn to pick up, sleep with, and you got to get, learn to tear through some chicks. Mm. Because if you're just going to settle down with the first girl you sleep with, you're going to, I guarantee you, a divorce. Mm-hmm. I guarantee it. And this is what my course is about. It's about how to sleep with them, how to test them afterwards if they're worthwhile, and how to retain them if they are. Mm-hmm. Because that's what you have to do in the, in the modern world. This is the only reality of it. And, and this is why I say to people, so... I don't agree with the uh, the MGTOW. I don't agree with none of that stuff. I think a man needs a woman to be happy. Hey, a lot of, I was just going to say is like, uh, just to, to stop you there real quick, I, I, I think that, and I'm just going to play devil, I'm going to play MGTOW's advocate here, is a lot of guys will say that if the, the more women you expose yourself to, the more apples, so you can you know get a better apple, whatever, um, the more women you expose yourself to, the more chances you have to get me too, just like you did. Uh, the more ch- the more chances you're going to have to uh, to get yourself into more trouble. I think that's. I mean, I, I honestly, I think this is almost kind of a cop out, but they're not wrong. I mean, you are opening yourself up to more potential to get me too. And I mean, shit, we even call it me too. It's a verb now, you know. Yeah. So what what do you, what would you say to somebody who says, you know, it's too risky? It's risk, it's risk versus reward. Mm-hmm. And yeah, there's a risk, but you can mitigate those risks by understanding the risk and being careful with how you text an email and be careful about it. But there's a reward to it. I'll tell you what, bro. If I walk in the club with my three girlfriends, I'm the, I am haven't got to spend a penny. I'm the richest guy in that club. Mm-hmm. Everyone's like, who the fuck is this guy with all those chicks? People are just like, like staring. Like, who the fuck is this dude? All these chicks hanging off him. I'm the richest guy in the club. So... There's risk and there's reward. If you want to, I'm always the guy. I'm a risk taker. I'm a fighter. Risk mm-hmm. fighting is the ultimate risk reward. You're risking getting knocked out and looking like a dickhead in front of everybody, or you're risking getting knocked out and never waking up, just for the reward of, of one of these. So I'm a, you're a risk taker by nature if you're a fighter. So if you if you if you want the reward, which I think every man instinctively wants, if you want a wife who truly loves you and truly respects you, you have to take the risk. Mm-hmm. That's the reality. The MGDAL guys are right, but what they're doing is they're running away from the from the risk. Well, that's mm-hmm. fine, but you could say you could use the same logic for opening a company. If I open a company, I might lose my money. Yeah, you might. You might be a millionaire. So it's 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 just like it's the risk reward that you have to take it on board. Mm-hmm. What I would say is if you're a MGTOW, what you need to do is understand the rules to the game. You're putting out fantastic content. Like your your content is far more in-depth than mine. My course is very much like a step-by-step process to make sure that every dude can, can fuck a new girl every week, how to test them and how to retain them if he wants to. But between what you and I put out there, there's not a guy alive who couldn't get a healthy relationship, tear through some chicks and then find one who actually truly treats them the way he wants to be treated and be a happy person. I don't think, I don't think that's impossible for anybody. Do you, never that you, you probably get this quite a bit though. Cause I'm sure there's a lot of dudes that will, will, th- and you know, here, here's your chance to advertise, but um, a lot of guys will say, well, you know, Tate, you got a million bucks. You're a millionaire. You've already got three chicks or the, or the only reason that the girls are hanging on to you is because you've got a lot of money. Yeah. Well, what would you say to guys like that? Well, I would say two things. Firstly, the reason I have a lot of money is because I had a lot of girls because I started my cam business. And right. I had some right. They, it's dependent on them. Okay. So I had some money, but I wasn't a millionaire. You know, I was a fighter, but I, I was living a very average, normal life. Fighting doesn't, kickboxing doesn't pay like boxing. So, mm-hmm. you know, I was living a pretty standard life in a standard house with a standard car. And I always had girls. In fact, I would say I did better back then than I do now. Because now, when you have money, girls expect a lot. 
Like back then I could go to a girl, oh, let's just meet up for a coffee or something. Now when you have money, girls are like, oh, I see you're in Dubai, fly me to Dubai. They're always trying to get something out of you. Mm -hmm. And that pisses me off and I don't give girls anything out of principle. So I, my biggest problem now is I have girls trying to sugar dad me and I refuse to do it. So I feel like sometimes I did better back then because I, I didn't have those expectations I, I have now. Anyway, that's the first thing. And the second thing is I know a whole bunch of dudes with money who are not happy with their female relationships. You see it time and time again. People richer than me, you know, a couple million dollars, whatever. There's billionaires out there whose wives are cheating on them and divorcing them. So it's nothing to do with money. It's to do with how a woman respects you. If I lost every penny today, and I know this is a big, this is a big thing for a red pill guy to say, I know my girls wouldn't leave. And I know, I know that sounds crazy, but I know if I went to jail, They'd be there every fucking Friday at visitation. I know it. And I know it because for so many years, I've been in absolute control of the frame of this relationship. I, I, I have complete understanding of my relationship. There's never been anything else. Mm -hmm. So I understand it. So when people go, oh, it's just about money. That's another cop out. Yeah. That's a complete cop out. That's one, I mean, of the, that's one of the reasons why I tell guys, it's like a, a lot of guys think that they're, they, they tend to focus on one uh, too much on one of three things either it's looks it's game or it's affluence it's money status blah blah, blah right and they think that the only way to get a girl is to have a lot of money right yeah. and in some instances maybe that's true because you can go and pretty much get any prostitute you want if you have the money to pay for it right yeah. but there's plenty of rich men whose why whose good looking wives cheat on them with pool boy yeah. okay yeah. or they want to right uh then there's like you know there's guys like me so when i was in my 20s uh, you know, I had like two nickels to rub together. I was living in a one bedroom studio apartment in North Hollywood. And I had, I was probably as poor as I'd ever been in my life. And I had women coming to me to have sex with them because I was, you know, I was junior rock star, right? I played, I, I had the look that they wanted. I was playing the character they wanted to see. Um, and then, so I had them coming to me to, to, to fool around, right? Uh, then I've got the guys who are going to say that, well, then it's all about looks, right? It must be just how you, how you look. And I will say that, you know, there's definitely something to that. You've got to be in shape and you've got to have at least something that is arousing for that woman. And, and I think a lot of guys underestimate the power of having a look, you know, like I, I have this great post called have a look. And I based it on this video that Adam Carolla did. And he was talking about how guys have to sort of play this character, like whatever that girl is looking for, whether she wants the emo guy or she wants the tough brother from the streets or she wants uh, an MMA fighter or she wants, uh, you know, that that's that's her thing. Right. That's that's what she's into. Maybe she wants the rock star. Maybe she wants the creative artsy type, that kind of guy, the guy who's playing that. But there's still that look that goes along with that. And, and it's not, fa it's not the fat guy look. Okay. It's the guy who at least has some sort of muscular definition. I think that there's an involved aspect of, of women's arousal that centers on men's looks. But is that all there is? No, that is not all there is. Um, is it game? Yes, definitely. It's uh, the, I think game is probably of, of the three game is probably the most important one. So at least you understand the rules of the game so that you know how to play that so that you have the kind of personality and you have the kind of, uh, you know, you, you invested in yourself, to become the best version of yourself that you possibly can and knowing how to use that, knowing what, you know, knowing certainly pickup artist and, you know, pickup art, PUA game, definitely, but also understanding why it works. Why does chick crack work? Why does amuse mastery work? Why does neck neg hits work? Why do, and being able to do that is one thing, but also having us, so I think that having all three of those things, which you appear to have is the, is the holy grail to so have you know have three if you can but yeah. have two if you can't have three always have two and if you can only have one have game have game I, above I, everything else i agree man like i, I there's there's plenty oh the green thing come up here uh sorry i'll i'll get to it <laughs> oh, um, well, actually we can we can here i'll we'll, we'll get to you go ahead finish your thought no but yeah game is the most important thing money I, i'll tell you something now from having a little bit of money girls don't give a fuck i mean like if, if you pull up in a lambo a girl, if you if you pull up in a Lambo and a girl sees it and then you go and approach her, it will buy you 10 seconds. For 10 seconds, she'll let you talk to her and go, well, who's this guy? But if after that you're boring or you're rude or you, she doesn't like you, then she's going to tell you to fuck off just the same. No girl sits there and goes, I don't like this guy. I think he's aggressive and I don't like his attitude. I, I don't just something about him I don't like. 
but he has a Gucci t-shirt, so I better go fuck him. It just, it just doesn't happen. Like, it, it, it helps, but it's only a small part of it. There's still a whole element which is involved, and that is game. I tell you this to all my guys. Like, everyone who's bought your book has given you positive reviews regardless of their status in life. Everyone who's bought my course has given me positive reviews. I've had five foot two overweight dudes with no money say to me, look, I know I'm never going to get a 10, but I'm doing a lot better than I did before I had your course. It's the same thing. You just got to play the cards you're dealt. You got to play the cards you're dealt the best you can. Yeah, and that's, there's, that's it. there's a, I, I think uh, this escapes a lot of guys when it comes to the game is there's a contextualization of, of of game itself like you have to use exactly you have to use the utilities and the the, the resources and the talents that you have like maximize play to your strengths right you know Absolutely. it's it's uh and understanding what those strengths are is sometimes difficult for guys like they don't understand you know what it is that they need to to focus on now i got this guy in here let's see um he's saying how how i, I think his name is Saud. he said how to beat the how be how to beat nature of the women when she like to get approved from society uh, how do you I, i'm gonna try to paraphrase what he says here how do you beat the nature of women how do you push past the nature of women when uh she gets approved from society i think what he means is like say in uh, in the era of social media, women's egos have been. Compl- we, I talked about this yesterday with with Pat, actually. Um, how, uh, in in the nature of for the nature of women, women's nature is played to by um, by social media. Women's egos, women's se- sexual market value has never been as overinflated as it is today because they have a worldwide access to attention to yep. ego affirming attention. Yep. If if you if you have if she has a problem with her boyfriend that day, she's got a hundred guys on Instagram who's ready to go, oh it's okay girl, I never would treat you that way. And so it really builds this false uh, this false sense of or a false sense of self, I think, for for women. Um, and I'll I'll answer this really quick and you can jump in here and just second I, I think that um, in in the communication age, or I should say the social media age, um, Social media gives to women pretty much the same thing that pornography gives to guys. And it gives to like men's sexual imperative is unlimited access to unlimited sexuality. That is why pornography online is free. It's there to sedate you. It's there to to keep you preoccupied. I'm not I'm not against or for pornography. I, however you want to deal with it, it's fine with me. I'm not coming down either way, but understand it for what it is. That reason that it, there's a reason that it's free and you don't pay for it. OK, yeah, there's a reason why well, what I uh, read to you or a porn hub or whatever is free. OK, because they because they know that it's 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 sedate, it's sedative for, for guys. Right. It's what they're looking for. They're looking for that sexual release. Social media has the same effect for women. Women need that attention. The attention is the coin of the realm in girl world. They yep. need to have that affirmation. They need to have their girlfriends pat them on the back. But moreover, they need to know that even if the boy that they're with right now dumps them, that they've got 10 other guys on speed dial, which in this case, it's that speed dial is Instagram and Snapchat. And that's one of the reasons why you are successful right now, because women like that. I mean, women wouldn't be doing Snapchat, premium Snapchats, or they wouldn't be cam girls, or there wouldn't be that if they didn't get off on it at some point. It has to have some sort of intrinsic value for women. And so there's that attention need. But as such, because we're in this this era of social media that feeds a woman's ego and it builds women's, I think, and falsely so, it builds women's sexual market value or their self-perception of their sexual market value and it and it inflates it to such a degree that it's unrealistic and i think that a lot of the women who are doing i mean because remember cam you know cam girls and snapchat and instagram that hasn't been around there that long i mean when did instagram start like probably eight, eight years ago 2010 so something like yeah yeah so we're, we're talking in human history it's only existed for like 10 years maybe if that and so I think that the women, the girls who are in their 20s right now who are doing this, when they get to be 30 and they realize that they can't cash out of the sexual marketplace like they thought they could, the reason that they get to that point is because they have been so over, their, their egos have become so overinflated and their sexual market value has become so bloated that yeah. they think that they deserve a guy like they might realistically be a six and they think that they deserve a guy who's a nine. 
because yeah. they think that they're a nine as well because everyone for the last 10 years has told them that they're a nine and that that's that's how they should should think about things and they find that in real life they're not really a nine they're maybe a six and so they have to they have to they're in for a very rude awakening that's why the reason when we were talking about the thought audit uh, I think that what's going to happen is even the girls who are, you know, not paying their taxes or, you know, the guys want to hit back against that. I think all the guys really need to do is wait. You just need to wait until, until they hit their, what I call the epiphany phase, right around 29 to 31 years old. And they're trying to cash out of the sexual marketplace or, you know, we like to call it the cock carousel, right? They're trying to, to get themselves uh, out of that system so that they can get with the beta. And then they'll find, then they'll find that the guys that they, that are available to them, are either stupid or they're boring or they're not as fun or exciting as the guys who are giving them attention back when they were in their 20s. And so I think the guy's question here is how do you push past that? How do you to deal with that? How do you um, like for for women who think they're a, they think they're a 9 but they're real, realistically maybe a 7. Like, so how do you what would you tell this guy? Well what what I teach let me do a bit of a plug here. My course, if you guys are watching, I'm going to type the motherfucking link right now. But um, Go ahead. I'm going to type the link. But in my course, because in my course, I talk about this for a good hour. But in my course, I talk about how male attention is hyperinflated. So there it is, take Shinkai.net. <laughs> and I talk about how male attention is hyperinflated and women suffer, not suffer, women enjoy unlimited male attention. Mm -hmm. So how do you add value to something well you make it you make it scarce gold has value because it's hard to find gold was everywhere wouldn't have value so i teach guys to put value on their attention and that's what my course a good hour of my course is about how you do that and my very basic principle is the way i put value the way you put value on something is to restrict it so i restrict my attention absolutely so if i'm talking to a girl and she says something semi-sarcastic to me or if she doesn't do what I want her to do, or she won't listen to me, I'll just stop replying. I won't insult her. I won't try and convince her. I'll just stop replying, bang, just vanish. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Most of these hot girls, no one vanishes on these girls, bro. No one vanishes on these girls. <laughs> the only dude who's like, what? I gave him some sarcastic bullshit answer and he didn't text back. And before you know it, they're the one liking your Instagram picture. They're the one trying to get your attention again. And you know, you might still have to be the man and pop up again a month later or something, but they'll like your pictures, they'll watch your stories. All of a sudden they're like, this guy, because your attention is now valuable. You're the one dude who fucked with them. Every other guy's telling them they're beautiful. You're the one dude who's like, you know what, fuck your shit, bye. And it's all about frame. This goes back to the very basics of the game. Frame, you wanna put value on your attention. I say this all the time with the biggest mistake people make in relationships is that especially busy guys. You're busy, you're working, you're doing your, you're always busy all the time. And you, you text your girl in the morning, okay, I'm having a busy day at work, love you, talk to you later. Yep. And she doesn't hear from you all day. Well, she doesn't get any attention. Whereas if she starts an argument and pisses you off, you'll take time out of the day to text her and tell her what a dumb bitch she is. Well, now she's learning how I get his attention is through negative action. Right. You gotta reverse that and talk to her all the time when she's being good. And when she starts to be a dickhead, Ignore them. Yes, that is that is what's called. And I'll, I'll, you know, it's this is exactly what I'm talking about when I say that whenever I am like listening to pickup artist tactics, there is a behavioral psychology parallel to that. What you've just described is called operant conditioning. Okay, yeah. what that means is, is you reward desired behavior and you punish punish or you or you simply withhold reward from non desired behavior. Yeah. Women do this all the time. And the way yeah. they do this, the most natural way they do this is they hold their pussy. They yeah. keep, they don't, they don't give you, they don't give you any sex until yeah. you perform the desired behavior, right? That's, and, and especially in a blue pill world, um, we, we buy into that. We buy into the you know, blue pill teaching, blue pill conditioning. Uh, it teaches you that you have to measure up or you, you either have to get lucky to get yeah. a girl or you have to have built up some kind of, uh, qualifications for for that for the to have merited her pussy right and I think uh, what what you're talking about here is I and, and I'm going to answer this guy's question right now is that um, not all attention is created equal okay 
So a beta's attention, you know this firsthand because you have cam girls who have tons and tons of thirsty betas. Yep. Beta attention is not the same attention as alpha attention. And I'm using those, I'm using alpha and beta as just as placeholder terms. We can debate alpha and beta on another show. But what I'm saying is that some guys, you know, low SMV guys, attention is always going to be worth less than high SMV guys. And that if that woman perceives you as high SMV, then your attention is going to hold more sway over her and she's going to want to to seek after that. The other part you said here is like, okay, first of all, you, you just described operant conditioning, which I think is great. The other thing is that um, in, in, in understanding that certain attention is more, more valuable than others, um, you have to be able to demonstrate and not explicate. So if like what you were saying, if, if, a, woman, uh, if a woman crosses a boundary that you have set, I, instead of having this ultimatum and saying, you better not do that again or else I'm going to, I'm going to leave you, young lady. You, you don't do that. You just leave. You just show her what the consequences are for crossing that boundary. Yep. And then maybe if she, if she decides she wants to get back in your good graces, then maybe you can go ahead and you know, say, okay, well, I'll give you a second shot. But she has to know that there are consequences and there are exercisable, actionable consequences for doing things. So if a woman says, I'm going to go out with my girlfriends on, on girls night out, guys, give this to me all the time. What should I tell her? Rolo? should I just, you know, t t I tell her no, and you know, put, be the man and put my foot down. No, you let her go. And if she goes out there and she does that and you don't want her all her shits on the fucking, uh, you know, the curb that, that night, if, if that's, if that is unacceptable behavior to you, then she needs to suffer the consequences of that. Don't tell her what the consequences are going to be. Make her experience the consequences of her crossing that boundary. Because that way, first of all, then she will be wanting to get your attention again because she fucked up. And so she's going to, and you're, if your attention is valuable, she, and she fucked up and you show her and you, you demonstrate and you don't explicate and you show her that she fucked up, then she's going to try to get back and try to reestablish that reward. And just like what you were saying, operant conditioning is she wants that reward. You've just given her punishment and she wants to reestablish the good feeling, she, which is attention from a high value man. Yeah. And if you, if you don't do that, if you talk a good, if you, all you do is talk, your, your, your attention is now declining in value. Absolutely. It doesn't matter. Even if you're arguing with a woman, even if you're calling her the worst names in the world, she's getting attention. I, I believe that one of the things in one of the, the, one of the segments of my course is that attention is the only weapon you have against women. In the sexual battlefield, the ways that it's all fucked up is because women are getting it. Here's how it should work. I'm a man. I give a girl my attention and she gives me sex. So I give my attention to get sex. She gives her sex to get attention. That's how it should work. That's the fair trade. But now you have girls who get all the attention without returning the sex part. And that's with friend zone bullshit. That's what friend zone is. She gets your attention. She doesn't give you the sex or Instagram followers, all that garbage. So the whole thing is skewed. So your attention is your weapon and you have to use it very, very effectively. And if you use it effectively, you can get any girl interested in having your particular attention because you put a value on it. Most of the guys out here, the guys who buy my course, when they come back and reply to me, they say, I never realized how much attention I was just giving away. That's exactly, there's nothing has a value if you just give it away. If you're following every chick, replying to every chick, going to see every chick every time she wants, and you're not progressing and getting anything in return, then who gives a shit about your attention? Mm -hmm. If I turn up on a date, the girl can just look through my Insta and see all the girls on there and the girls I'm following and the life I live, and she'll know that me even turning up is a deal. Mm -hmm. It's too, if your, if your attention is too easily had, it becomes valueless to, Absolutely. to that woman. And I, I think guys really kind of underestimate the value that attention has and that there are, there's different valuations of, of attention. One thing that I, one big disservice I think we do to blue pill guys and, and conditioning them to be blue pill is to, like I said, put that woman as your mental point of origin. Uh, the, the blue pill will say you need to, you need to support her and you need to make her comfortable. I think that's another lie that we tell, we tell blue pill guys is we tell them uh, you need a, a woman needs to be comfortable with you before she'll have sex with you. Absolutely. Categorically false. Women, uh, women want to have that urgency. They want to have that anxiety. They want to have, that's why we call it sexual tension. 
They yeah. want to have that. They want to, first of all, they have to value your 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 attention in the first place as a high value guy. But they have to have that kind of they have to be on edge. There's got to be an uncertainty that you're going to pick them. That's one of the things that that pickup artists have always said since the earliest days is that <clears throat> guys need to make themselves the prize, right? They need to become the prince, and they need to start thinking of themselves as the prince. And therefore, their attention, even if they're playing, even if they're talking, you know, even if it's fake it till they make it kind of thing, at least they need to treat themselves as if they have that, as if their attention is valuable. And then the other thing that we teach guys also is we, we try to teach them that, that, that a woman needs to be comfortable with him at the, in the beginning. That's like I said, that's completely false, but it's false because you push past that urgency stage, you push past all of that stuff, and you go like the feelings of comfort and familiarity and uh, trust and all of that, those are post-orgasm feelings, yeah. okay? Those are what the oxytocin inspire in, you know, inspires in a woman. When, it, when a woman gets off and she has an orgasm, she's flooded with all this, this chemical cocktail, and part of that is oxytocin, and that's when she wants to spoon with you, and she wants to, you know, where is this going, you know, and that kind of stuff. That's when she wants to, to sort of feel trust with you. But guys, by going straight into that, they bypassed all the sexual urgency. And the reason that they do that is because they're uncomfortable and they don't really, most blue pill guys don't know what to do. Yeah. And they just want to push past that as quick as they can because they think that the sex is in the familiarity stages and in the comfort stages. It's not. Yeah. It's in the anxiety and the urgency stages. That's where the, that's where sex happens. Um, and it's, it's, it's fueled by desire, genuine desire. It's fueled by anxiety. It's fueled by dread sometimes. Uh, it is... Uh, but, but we, we, most blue pill guys think that they got to get to comfort as, as soon as possible. And so how do they do that? They make their attention valueless. They make it so, because they want that woman to be, to know that like he's there for her and he's going to be the perfect boyfriend for her and, and but throws out all of his entire life story on the restaurant table. And so, you know, he, he's, everything's, uh, he's an open book, right? His life is an open book, but women don't want an open book. They want to figure out how that guy got to be who he is. They want to. They want the guy to be a challenge, and they want to think that their their instinctive nature, their their, their feminine intuition, is how they figured the guy out. And if he just gives it to them, he's taken away that stimulus. He's taken away all of that um, that need to feel that chemical rush, that urgency. That is this guy really going to fuck me? Is he really going to be a good guy? Is he? Uh, who is this guy? I can't figure him out. You know, he's an enigma, right? That's why we say, you know, retain your attention and just give it out like sparingly. Like it's like breadcrumbs, right? You just throw out a little bit and she follows along. You throw out a little bit more, she follows along and let her unravel you. Let her, you know, discover you. You're an onion, right? It's layer, layer by layer, figuring how, you know, who you are. Because if you don't, you deny them the pleasure of doing that. You deny them the pleasure of having to, to figure you out rather than going straight to this, okay, you know, we might as well be married. Let's go and uh, have breakfast at IHOP today. You know, that kind of shit. If you get, if you get to the point where it's, it's ice cream cones and puppy dogs, that's, you, you, you fucked up. You, you've gone through the urgency stage and the arousal stage and straight into the post orgasm oxytocin comfort stage. And that, I'm, I'm, I'm rambling here, but I'm just going to say that, that that's part of attention is if, if you make your attention valueless to that woman, she's not going to come. You're not going to get a second date. You're not going to, you're not going to go past. She's, she's actually going to try to get away from you as possibly as fast as she possibly can, because she's figured it, figured you out. She's filtered you, her hypergamy, her hypergamous nature has filtered you out because you are too easy. Absolutely. You're too easy. Yeah. That comes from two things. A lot of women don't actually think, they may pretend they think they're special, but a lot of them are insecure and don't think they're that special. And if you give all your attention to a chick, a lot of them, they sit there and go, well, who'll give it to anyone? So, uh, well, we're coming up on two hours, so I'm, just, I'm about to close shop here. Um, one thing I would just give me one quick answer here. Okay, so if you've, got, if you've got a nine or a 10, a chick who's super smoking ass hot, yeah. do you think that she's easier to game is she more, here's the, this might be the myth. Is she more insecure because she's hot? Because like guys don't, are too cowardly to approach her? Do you think that there's any truth in that? You know what I've actually discovered about super hot girls? I, and this is, goes against what a lot of people think I've found, is that I think super hot girls in many ways are better quality women than average chicks. And I'll tell you why. Average chicks genuinely, in my experience, 
have more sexual partners than super hot girls because super hot girls get the chance to be super exclusive with who they fuck. Mm -hmm. And they usually only fuck guys that have that they, that they want. If you're a super, super beautiful girl and your, your Instagram inbox is full of blue check marks and millionaires. If you get with a guy, you're probably going to stay with him for at least a year or two, or you're going to see him now and again. If you're just an average ass chick, you might sleep with a guy on a night out, sleep with another guy here. That, but in my experience, the most beautiful women have lower body counts. And that, mm -hmm. that blows a lot of people's minds because they see it the other way around. Mm -hmm. But I think in general, the, the super beautiful women have, have lower body counts and, 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 they're, and they're better women overall. That's, that's just my personal experience. Cool. Cool. But, uh, go on. No, I was just gonna say, and, and I, 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 I would tend to agree with you. I think there a lot of a lot of guys get intimidated by exceptionally beautiful women, and they don't want to make those approaches. Shit, most guys these to, to the, today are too nervous to make any kind of approach. I think they have too much in the way of buffers. Yeah. Uh, they think that Tinder is the only way that they can get laid, or that they they think it's the easiest. You know, it's like the shortest distance between two points. And I think that that's a big mistake because I think guys depend too much on like Instagram or well, uh, IMs and texts yeah. and, and, and Tinder and all that other kind of stuff. And uh, it's been my experience that the guys that I counsel say that Tinder sucks. Like yeah. it is, it's like the worst thing in the world for them. I say, well, then learn fucking game, dude. Learn how to, uh, you know, learn how to actually interact with a woman face to face because you know what, in today's day, it, it's pretty refreshing, I think, you know, to, to have a, a guy that actually has the balls to come up and make an approach on a girl, um, yeah. you know, and then, of course, well, if you go do that, then, you know, you risk getting me too and it's sexual assault. And if she thinks you're creepy, get away from me. And it's like, okay, I mean, guys, guys convince them. So they 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 kill them. They kill their their yeah. impetus is what they do. There's problems with it all. But I mean, my very basic philosophy is as follows. And if I had I, 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 the reason I know I've mentioned my course and over and over again, but that's fine. I explain it <laughs> thoroughly there. Yeah. But uh, genuinely, it's, it's as simple as this. There's three and a half billion women on the planet. I am not, a, I am the guy who takes no for an answer. I'm not one of them pickup artists who goes, when she says no, what you say is this. And if she says no again, what you say is this. I'm the absolute opposite. If I'm talking to a chick and she goes, well, I've got a boyfriend, I might say something like, oh, well, he's not here, so who cares? No, but I love him. Okay, fine. Nice to meet you. Bye. And in my experience, 99% of the time, they're like, oh, fuck, he left. Mm -hmm. then, then they're like, oh, shit, he's gone. Now he's talking to some other girl. Yeah. Like, I really am the dude who's like, it's a numbers game. You want to fucking play stupid games with me? You want to act like a dickhead? You want to whatever, whatever? I'm out. I don't give a fuck. There's no girl on this planet who's so different from the others. You can show me a beautiful blonde with big titties. There's other there's other beautiful blondes with big titties. Right. I, I'm not playing the game with, with them on that level. And I don't recommend any guy do that. You don't need to be fucking around with any girl like that. If a girl gives you that bullshit, then just don't talk talk to someone else. Mm -hmm. No, no amount of pussy is worth yourself. You're see, yeah, yeah and you're, it's, not, it's no no amount of pussy is worth you losing frame first of all, and then no amount of pussy is worth you uh, having to compromise your integrity. Absolutely, and, and you're not going to be happy anyway. And then she's going to sense you compromise your integrity, and then she's not going to be happy. And it's just a spiral of nothing. Yeah. Just to, to wrap up, I know we're wrapping up, but I say this all the time, and I know I always use chess analogies. But if you're losing in a, I say this. I had a guy who I was talking to, and he said. Me and my girlfriend aren't getting along, and she keeps talking to these other guys. She says to her friends, what should I do? I was like, bro, just leave her. He goes, no, but I really like her. I said, listen, if things carry on the path they're going, you're going to split up. She's going to cheat on you, and you're going to split up. The only chance you have of fixing it is to leave her out of the blue and shock her mm -hmm. into actually losing you, and she might fix up and change her game and stop talking to the dudes and get her shit together. Mm -hmm. Now, what's more important? I know you want to keep her. But those extra few weeks of a sexless relationship before she cheats on you, are they really worthwhile, bro? You need to be a man and do the right thing now. Just say to her, you know what? Choose me or them. You're going to text them again, I'm out. And if she texts them, just fucking walk out the door, fuck her, and watch her change her game up. Because it's like a chess game. If you're in a losing position and the only hope you have, even if it's a 1% chance, is to sacrifice a piece. Well, you're going to lose if you don't play it. You might still lose if you play it, but it's your only chance. So anyway, he didn't listen to me and she cheated on him and whatever. And now he keeps messaging me going, you know what? I should have left. I was like, I fucking told you. you the, the end result was basically going to be the same anyway. Uh -huh. the, only, the only hope you had, you wasted it. So I'm one of them guys. I'll take the risk. If you fuck with me, bye. Get out. Mm -hmm. And I've lost, I've lost beautiful girls I didn't want to lose. 
but I never broke frame. And so I, I thought, think I think oh. and I think that a lot of guys get into that situation and they already have a scarcity mentality. I mean, we we always talk about the eighty twenty rule. We talk about the Pareto principle and how eighty percent of guys are beta and and twenty percent of guys are alpha for just you know round or general terms. Yeah. Um, but it's those guys who who their only option is that girl. Their only option is the one that they're stuck with. And they think that that's going to be the best girl that they could ever get. So they better do what she says, or they better like, you know, or they, or they doubt themselves. They yeah. doubt themselves because they, they, they doubt that they'll be able to generate a, another option as hot as this one or whatever. And so they are willing to tolerate, I mean, men in general are, are just more willing to tolerate more bullshit from women than guys that they would, that, you know, than their best friends, right? I mean, the shit that you would get into a fight with your best friend, you'll you'll take that all day from a woman that you're having sex it's with. True. So, but that's only if that is your only option. And I think that's one thing that game and certainly red pill awareness, you know, instills in guys is that you uh, confidence is derived from options, and you need to learn how to create more options. Absolutely. And therefore, then you don't get into those. And then it's easier for you to leave. You know, it's far easier for you to get a new job or, or excuse me, uh, to ask for a raise when you already have a, a, a new job in the wings, Absolutely. right? So the same, same principle. Anyways, okay. Uh, we are at the two-hour mark here. Uh, this has been a great first show. Uh, we got to do this again. I, I, maybe like in a couple of months or something like that, we'll, we'll do something. I, you know, I'll tell you what, after you're done with your fight, We'll talk. We'll get. We'll come back on here again, and we'll talk about that, and you, we can sort of see how you how it went from there. Um, really quick, go ahead and give your um, your website out, and then where people can find you on Twitter. Right. So I don't know how long I'll last. But I'm current. <laughs> I'm yeah, current. and 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 don't let the uh, the avatar picture fool you. <laughs> yeah, I'm currently at Tate Speech, my fifth my fifth resurrection on Twitter. So Tate T A T E Speech. Um, my YouTube is youtube.com slash take speech, the same. And then I have take shinkai.net where I have all my coaching courses and all those kind of things. If I ever get banned from Twitter again, I'll probably still be on the YouTube and uh, me and Rollo will stay in touch anyway. So yeah, we well, yeah, I'll still have you on as long as I don't get deep platform. We'll see how that works out. But I'm, I'm my, my channel is very new. Actually, people are thinking, how, how come you don't have, you know, how come you never had a channel to begin with? It's like, cause I'm mostly a writer. I'm a, thanks for the $5 super. Um, I'm mostly a writer, and I'm like I said, I'm working on my fourth book right now, uh, and so this is where I do it in here. And so uh, I think that uh, this helps me sort of get out and and sort of pick other people's brains. And so it's it's yeah. a, it's a good exercise for me too. So I'm trying to make myself a little bit more accessible and a little more available. Uh, of the three R's in the manosphere, I think I am probably the most accessible. So uh, that said, um, make sure you follow and you subscribe here. Uh, make sure you follow and subscribe Tate's, uh, Tate's Guys on channel. I already put it in the description there. Uh, and let's see, uh, you can find me on the Redman Group. We gotta ha we'll probably have you on the Redman Group pretty soon. I think we're going to do an all-game show at some point. We'll probably have you and Christian. If I can ever get Christian McQueen on the, sh on yeah, the show, it would be great to have you and Goldman and him on there or maybe even Kyle probably would be a, that would be a fun show uh we have uh the red man group we're doing the all uh the all I think it's married red man group is coming up pretty soon I think uh it's either this it's either this Thursday or next we're going to doing that on Thursdays now I just want to throw these announcements out there real quick um my own channel I'm on with Pat Campbell on Friday mornings uh 905 Eastern on uh, AM 1170. Just look at my Twitter for announcements for that. I usually put it on the night before, but that, that is Friday mornings. Um, and then I also do our Red Pill 101 on Sundays uh, at uh, 4.30 Eastern. And uh, keep watching here. I think I'm going to make this a regular thing. Uh, this will just simply be the Rational Mail. And I'll be doing this on Mondays. Uh, I, the times might vary, but uh, sometime around noon, I think, on Mondays is when we'll, we'll start doing this regularly. So that said, Tate, thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you in Poland. I hope, I hope we, can, we can meet up and, and go do something. I don't know. Yeah, you're, you're gonna you're gonna be fighting with Ivan Throne pretty soon too, so that might be some that might be an interesting video too. We'll see how it goes, but yeah, I'll 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 um, I'll, uh, I'll drive up to Poland this summer. For yeah, sure. cool. All right, man. Thanks for coming in, and thanks for everybody in the chat, and thanks for those supers, and I'll see you next week. Thanks a lot.
I'm a chiropractor, and here are three simple changes for joint discomfort that make me zero dollars. There are three simple changes I tell all of my arthritis patients to make. Number one, you have to start drinking more water. You wouldn't believe how dehydrated most people are. Number two, you need to make a decision to take matters into your own hands. That's not to say you should go against your current doctors, but you don't have to settle for a cabinet full of pills, and this is as good as it's going to get. Number three, I tell them to raid their own refrigerator. Even people that think they eat healthy overall don't realize just how many of the foods they have been eating basically their whole life are keeping them in pain. Out of the five foods listed as the worst foods for arthritis, most of my patients were eating at least four of them every single day. Within days of eliminating these foods from their diet, their joints became less stiff and their flexibility and range of motion came back. If you want to see what I tell my patients to eliminate from their diet, click the button in this video to see the five worst foods for arthritis. Ah, the ups and downs of running a painting business. When you're up, it's like a dream. But when you're down, it's a nightmare. Slow times, it can sneak up on you. It can also be hard to predict when it's coming. But what if there was a way to blow slow times head off? Do you have aggressive growth goals for your painting company? Are you hungry for more? Well, if so, you want to hear a little something about base coat marketing. Base coat is a premium service marketing company specializes in creating high quality leads through Google search, social media, and other digital channels. Baseco works with residential and commercial painters, epoxy floor companies, and whatever the f this is. Oh, ooh. Now, I know the market can be volatile, and the revenue can look a lot like this throughout the year. But Baseco helps flatten that curve. Not only does Baseco help flatten that curve so business stays steady year round, they make it grow exponentially that's money out more money in baby money, 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 money. spend less time trying to make money and more time making money with base coat marketing always under promise over deliver I wonder if you lot at home are jealous okay. of me. You know? Because my life's exciting. It is exciting.